I would now like to call the May 19th, 2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Could we please start with the roll call? Yes, Mayor Bagley is uh, not on the meeting yet. Council Member Christensen? Here. Council Member Hidalgo Faring? Here. Council Member Martin? Here. Council Member Peck? Here. Council Member Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Mayor Pro Tem, you have a quorum. Thank you. At this time, uh, we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody ready? All right. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the flag. United, States United States of America, America. 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 to the republic America. for which it stands, it stands some nation, 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 God, God. indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty, and justice, and justice, justice for, all. for all. All right, that always sounds so good. All right, uh, first I'll do the uh, reminder to the public for anybody wishing to speak during first call public invited to be heard on our public hearing item, on our, any of our public hearing items or for our final call public invited to be heard. You'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting. Instructions for how to call in to provide comment will be given during the meeting and displayed on the screen at the appropriate times during the meeting. Comments are limited to three minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. At this time, uh, we will do the approval of minutes. I see no approval of minutes for this session. Is that correct? All right, That's then uh, we shall take agenda revisions and submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add any agenda items to the future agendas. All right, in a second here, let me maximize my screen so I can see everybody. Uh, Council Member Peck and Marshall. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. I actually have two motions tonight and I'm bringing them forward because when we were on WebEx, we didn't have any way to do public input and now that we're on Zoom, we do. So um, I'm going to move to direct staff to bring forward the second reading on Metro districts at the next regular session. Can I have a second? I'll second that. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this item? Councilmember Waters. Yeah, it won't surprise um, uh, Councilmember Peck or the others on this uh, program or on this uh, in this meeting that I, that I'm I think that's a bad idea. I'm going to vote against the motion. And I understand, you know, the fate of Metro districts may be done. Uh, I will say I think anything to do that we do right now under these conditions that make it more difficult to house people in Longmont is irresponsible. And and I just think generally. We ought to wait until we can have a, a fuller face-to-face, -face, more robust discussion and carefully analyze the implications of, of doing what it seems like we're going to do. But to do it under these circumstances feels to me like it is, it's a disservice to a whole bunch of people who are housing insecure in this town right now are going to be more so when we come out of this pandemic. So I'm going to vote against it. I think it's a bad idea. I think it, I think it does not keep faith with what we said we're going to do in terms of public input. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Um, I have a different reason for wanting to postpone this, which is that uh, as people have become housing insecure as a result of their layoffs or because of the strange circumstances of being homeless during a pandemic or whatever, I have. Uh, uh, a short list, not a huge list, but a short list of other housing related items that I think should be considered by the council. And so um, my belief is that we should consider them um, close together, one after another at an appropriate time so that we can see how they interact with one another. Uh, and for that reason, I would I would rather postpone because, for example, I don't think that the staff has the the time to get together a sources of income ordinance for Longmont right now. Thank you, Council Member Christensen. This is something that we have carefully discussed and analyzed since November the 7th. And um, 
This leaves developers hanging. I don't think that's appropriate. I, this is the second and final reading. We have discussed it and discussed it for months. Uh, everyone has had many, many opportunities to weigh in. And I cannot understand how people think this has to do with providing affordable housing. It does not. And we need to get this out of the way so we can discuss other housing options. Um, this has just been hanging and we need to be moving along through some things so that we can start dealing with all the things that we've left hanging uh, during the coronavirus. And uh, this is something that's just been uh, put off and put off and put off. And as Councilwoman Peck says, now that we have the ability for people to to uh, voice their opinion again, albeit on um, a Zoom meeting, it's nevertheless uh, appropriate to move on and go forward with all the other things that are piling up. So this is one thing we can um, just have a final hearing on. Everybody have their voice heard and um, make a, take a vote, make a decision and move on to something more productive. All right. Well, I suppose I'll just chime in real quickly that uh, part of the reason it was postponed in the first place was due to the lack of the ability to have a proper public hearing. And in my opinion, while it, we have been able to have comments from the public during these Zoom meetings, I'm pretty sure most would agree that they are not as robust as they normally would have been in an in-person setting. And I'm concerned that, and there was a, a somewhat of a tacit agreement that we try not to bring things that are, are particularly controversial to uh, our constituents during this time where it's difficult for many of those to be able to participate in this process. So I'm concerned about that. And I'll probably at this time vote accordingly. Um, Council Member Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I disagree with you in that we have had several, several meetings uh, about this where all interested parties have weighed in. We've had letters from uh, the chamber. We've had uh, uh, in, I'm losing my train of thought here. We've had discussions from uh, the Real Estate uh, Association, from LEDP, from the Chamber. We have had, uh, at the last robust meeting that we had, we had uh, investors fly in from Canada that made their, um, their reasons for wanting to do business in Longmont heard. We had people fly in from Chicago. Uh, We've had three robust, or the ability to have robust comments about this uh, issue. I just want to get off of our plates some of the issues, rather than keep dragging them out, that we can actually get, get off of our plate. It also leaves the planning department kind of hanging. They don't know whether what we're going to do, if this is going to pass or fail. And uh, this is about six months now that we've been saying we need more input from the public, we need more input from developers. At what point do we say we have enough? We have enough input. Um, no matter what, no matter what our platform is, there are gonna people be people who say we need more input. Um, I, I disagree and that's why I brought it up. Because when I look at our agenda, we don't have very many things that can just be an up and down vote and get off of our plate. Um, so that's why I brought it up. So I call the question, uh, let's vote. Or I have a different, uh, I would like to amend my own motion if that's possible. Absolutely. You okay. Can change your motion. Uh, yeah, I would like to change this motion that. Uh, we may move to direct staff to bring forward the second reading on metro districts at the first meeting that is held on a, in a public venue, probably in our council chambers. It looks like uh, from the emails that we got today from Don that we're looking at July, possibly to be moving back into our chambers once they've been remodeled. So um, I would like this to be on the first agenda of the regular meeting 
when we are back in the public domain. So that's my amended motion. Is that a second, second count? I believe Council Member Christensen seconded that. Okay. Uh, so. Any <laughs> any conversation on the amended motion beyond what may has already may have already been said? Doesn't appear so. So let's take a vote. Okay. Can All we those in, hmm? can we do a hand vote this time instead of a, a verbal, so we can actually see so John Fryer can see who votes for. Let's go. Let's go person by person. Call the roll. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do a vote roll, a roll vote. Okay. All right. I guess I'll just go based on my screen. Uh, Council Member Martin. No. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Um, I will support the amended uh, motion. Council Member Christensen. Yes. Council Member Peck. Support. Council Member Waters? No. And I vote no. The motion fails three to three. You had another motion, Council Member Peck? Oh, yes, thanks. I do. So, uh, using the same criteria that we can now have people call in, uh, I move to direct staff to bring forward the Longmont Development Code amendments. Uh, including the wildlife master plan at the next regular session. Um, the, the wildlife master plan has been done for a while. And from my input, they're just waiting for council to give them to go ahead to implement that. Do I have a second? Council member Martin. Yes, a statement. Uh, I am not seconding, so I'll okay. wait to comment. I see. We have a second discussion. Council Member Martin. Um, yeah, I don't see any problem with bringing this forward, but um, normally we have a little discussion with the team that's bringing it forward. And I don't know, you know, I know that the um, the wildlife management team is having technical issues at Button Rock right now, and they're having issues at Union Reservoir, and they're having issues at uh, Creekside. And so the plan may be done, but they may or may not be ready. So I would entertain this motion happily next week or the following week, but I'd like to ask them first. Did I see Councilmember Hidalgo Ferry? No? Was it Councilmember Christensen? I saw somebody raise a hand. I, it was me. I would actually okay. it was to um, second her motion. Oh, okay. Uh, Councilmember Waters. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I, I, I would not. I wouldn't be disinclined to oppose this, except uh, I, I don't know how. I, I I wouldn't know how to to go through this without putting the SES next to it. Uh, there is this relationship. We have the report on the SES. We don't, it would be nice to know what the status report is on that. What parts of that have we concluded can roll up at this point in the wildlife management plan? I understand part, I don't know the thinking behind the motion, but based on, on what we've seen in the last 24 hours about what's going on in a riparian area and the, the level of public interest, um, at which seriously disturbs me as I look at the photos of this, uh, not pat, you know, approving the plan wouldn't change that, but it might give more visibility and, and certain some certainly some enforcement uh, capability because I it's, it's I think appalling what we've seen. Um, so if that's the motivator, I I get that. Uh, I just I, I'm I'm not clear on what these relationships are now between the SES and the Wildlife Management Plan, and and to me it's going to be a mistake if we're if we're not all real clear on what those are and what the timelines are for the SES in relationship to the wildlife. So, um, and I don't know that this is the best format for, for that kind of analysis and, and uh, synthetic work that would have to happen. Well, I would definitely like to hear kind of a timeline or, or status update from staff that deals with those various uh, code amendments. So we know where they are in the process without I guess, kind of artificially pressuring them to bring something forward if it's not yet quite ready for public consumption. Um, 
I don't know how you feel about that, Council Member Peck, or get it maybe something from Jim, uh, Assistant City Manager Marsh. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez and members of Council, Joni Marsh, Assistant City Manager. So we are prepared to bring the SES forward at this time. That is done and completed. The riparian setback criteria that are the other code component are in final legal review right now. So those are nearing completion. If there's another component, um, I may not be aware of another component that Council Member Peck is referring to um, with regard to the wildlife management plan itself, but we are close and we should be able to get those scheduled if Council so chooses. Okay. What about uh, Councilman Waters? Uh, would you be adverse to bringing back the SES plan by itself? I wouldn't be, I'm not, I'm not averse to either, to either the wildlife management plan, the, the code changes that go with it, uh, but those things, the, the wildlife management plan and code and the SES and code seem to be, are, are, go hand in glove. I mean, it, we've got to do that in a thoughtful way together. Um, so, you know, it reflects what are those expectations and, um, and gets translated into decision making. Uh, at the same time, it just seems to me. So uh, I don't know what the best sequence is, Councilmember Peck. I just, I just think we ought to have those together in some fashion. I don't know which leads, or we have them on the same agenda. Um, that's my concern. So are you happy with your motion as is, Councilmember Peck? No, uh, not because, because of what... Um, Assistant City Attorney Johnny Marsh brought forward, but whether we put them together or not, I think that we, I, I'm going to make men, amend my motion to bring back the SES plan then. So we get some of this done. We're not, we're not moving forward on anything. And that, that bothers me a little bit. When I look at our agenda, it is basically about COVID most of the time, which I understand. But uh, I'm very concerned that for three months now, we, we haven't really moved anything and some things are ready to be moved forward. So I amended to bring back the SES uh, plan at our next regular meeting. I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, we'll take a vote similar to the last one. I'll call roll by the way our council members appear on my screen. Council Member Martin? Yes. Council Member Hidalgo Faring? Yes. Council Member Christensen? Yes. Council Member Peck? Yes. Council Member Waters? Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes six to zero with Mayor Bagley uh, absent, but it looks like he'll be joining us momentarily. So why don't we wait a few minutes for, I believe somebody else had an agenda revision or something to direct. Okay, there it was. Let's see if he gets gets on with us. Mayor, can you hear us? He needs to unmute himself. All right, can you now? Yes, we can. All right, great. Hey guys, sorry about that. My computer decided to install 45 minutes of updates. So I apologize. So Aaron, where are we? Council member Martin's up next with an agenda revision or motion to direct. Great, why don't you go ahead then? Thank you, Mayor. Bagley and Mayor Pro Tem. Um, uh, it's not, uh, I, I hope it doesn't need to be a motion. I would like to request a report from the airport manager on two matters of airport finance um, as soon as possible. And I did check in advance and I think that uh, the staff is ready to do this or will be by the next regular meeting. Um, uh, one is I'd like a report of the past grants received by the airport um, and any remaining financial obligation uh, uh, therefrom. 
And second, I would like an explanation in detail of the funds transfer from the city's general fund to the airport detailing what services um, uh, that fund transfer represents. How does so that, this, does how this does that need to be? Uh, yeah, how does that translate into direction, Mayor Bagley? It's just, just a request. Is it? Is what, it what, what, you're just requesting information, right? Well, I think I, I would be curious about some of the same kind yeah, of information. Well, every, every, I, think, I think we're all allowed to, like, I mean, technically we can use a couple hours a week to, to ask staff for info. Harold, can you just get that information to her? Okay, I think that's all we need to do. Yeah, I, I'd I like everyone to have it. Yeah. Okay, Harold, can you, get us, can, can you forward it all to us? Yeah, we'll pull that together and, and send it to all the council members as quick, or well. We'll try to move quickly as possible in this week or two, maybe, if not three. We lost you. Were there any books on agenda items in the future that I missed by any chance? Yes, there were two. What were Aaron, do you want to go over asked? those? Yes, uh, Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Peck made a motion to bring back the second reading of Metro Districts at our first in-person meeting, the vote failed three to three. And then the second measure or the second motion was to bring back uh, the SES tool as it is ready for council consideration to be adopted into the land development code that passed six to zero. Just out of curiosity, who, how the, the Metro District, how'd that fall out? Just out of curiosity. Uh, who wanted to bring it back? Council Member Peck, Council Member Hidalgo Ferry, and Council Member Christensen voted for. All right, cool. Just curious. Sounds like he has a fun first 15 minutes. All right. Anybody else have any motions to bring back? All right, great. Then let's go ahead and move on. You've already approved the minutes. Have we already done our COVID-19 update? No, we haven't. All right, let's go on to that then, Harold. Did Dan Eamon get online? Yes, he did. Oh, oh, he did. Okay. There's Dan. Hey, Dan, do you want to go over any of the, can you go over the county numbers and the hospitalizations based on what you're seeing? And then I'll go from there. And I've got screenshots I can use if you want me to. I sure can. Let me bring them up real fast here so I can go over them. I think in general, what we're seeing is um, a couple things. One is testing um, is increasing pretty significantly. Test kits are becoming pretty rapidly available. Um, I think you probably all heard the governor say that tests are becoming more and more available to anybody that is symptomatic. So as a result of that, certainly um, positive cases are going up, but the hospitalization rates are going down. Uh, you know, they're 30% they're below where they were a few weeks ago for COVID patients. Um, the med surge beds are going up, which is a good thing. That means they're starting elective procedures again. So all of those things are good. The trends remain really good on the hospital side of things, which is what we really are looking for. Um, the case numbers are you know, good to watch, but really the increase is a factor of testing rather than anything else. So the hospitalizations are, are decreasing as we hoped they would. So I think that's all trending in a very positive way. And the testing is becoming more and more available in the county. So all those things are positive. Harold, anything else you want me to touch on? Are there any questions about the testing and, and, and that arena before we move on? Okay, not seeing any. Okay. You say, we, I assume move on with the COVID-19 update? Correct. Keep going. Okay, sorry. All right. Uh, the, Mayor Council, the one thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, start off with um, a little bit of uh, kind, uh, an example of the amazing folks that we have here in the organization. So as you know, We've had people at home um, that it was more difficult for them to work from home. And Ann Maka, uh, who works at the museum, came up with an idea um, to bring um, staff together that couldn't necessarily do their job from home. And um, we repurposed them and they actually were uh, making masks for the organization in the community. 
And the last count that I actually have, um, as of around last Friday, they were close to a thousand masks that they had made. And so what we're going to do between that and what we've had through donations, once we make sure that we have provided everything that we need um, to our organization, we're then going to look at how we can engage in certain neighborhoods in this process. And so um, when we talk about how do we creatively repurpose folks and, and bring them part of, in, as part of the bigger initiative, this is a, a great example. And it was just outstanding work. They actually pulled it together in a day or two. Um, and then went to making masks. And so um, I believe it was around 10, let's just say a couple of weeks, they, they hit that number. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of things that we have going on across the organization that I just wanted you all to know about and, and how folks come together to, to deal with these situations. Right now, you may have heard the governor's update, um, and this is where a lot of the work is, is really starting for, for us. Um, when you really look at what we're going, what we're dealing with right now, um, the reopening process is significantly more complicated uh, than the closing process. Um, and it's really because of all the nuances that we're seeing in terms of group size and what types of facilities can be open and what that looks like. Um, and, and so we're really working through any number of issues um, having to frequently reach out to Boulder County or, and then they'll reach out to the state to get clarity on some of those orders and what they mean and, and how does this actually apply um, um, to what we can open and when we can open. Um, another thing in, in the governor's guidance that we're starting to hear um, is there will be some guidance that will be released within the week uh, regarding the restaurant openings. Um, this is even going to be more complicated in terms of how we look at those issues because, and then the governor will make the decision on uh, May, approximately May 25th. Um, the reason why it's becoming um, more complicated is, I think as the governor has talked about this and as we've seen from letters that we've received, he's asked cities to really work with restaurants in terms of being creative to allow them to um, utilize sidewalks, alleyways, parking lots, so they can actually increase capacity for their, their business so they can, um, from an operational standpoint, you, you know, really have uh, the magnitude of tables available where it makes sense for them to operate. Um, in addition to that, um, we were also looking at some of the guidance related to liquor licensing and um, business extensions and how we need to move through that. So there will be changes coming Specifically because when they allow them to open, they're still going to allow the um, takeout component of alcohol sales to occur, which will create some other other issues within the licensing framework in general. So we have Don and Joni and the judge and multiple people working on what we can do in terms of creating that process to, to help facilitate that reopening. Um, there is a lot of work involved in this and in, in bringing those um, and, and assisting those businesses once they're allowed to reopen. Um, the other thing is, as you all know, we have been incrementally reopening facilities. Um, you saw that we did a soft opening of the tennis courts and then we announced it. We also did the same thing with skate parks um, and, and, and moving to announce it. The, the issue and what's driving those reopenings is basically the, the guidance um, that we received from Boulder County and the state of Colorado on these issues. One of the things that you all know that you're probably still getting questions about is baseball fields, softball fields, and, and what that can look like. The, the issue with that is, and we've got this question into it because um, via the state orders, team sports are specifically prohibited meaning they're not allowed to, to occur. We've posed some questions based on the group size and what that can look like, and we're waiting on feedback um, in terms of how we can operationalize that in a way. The one thing that I think I'm fairly confident in saying is, at least what we've heard to this point is, even if they are, even if the orders will allow us to do something, the group size will still be limited to 10 unless that's changed via a state order. Um, we are also in the process of working in terms of what it's going to look like um, in terms of the openings of our buildings. Um, I mentioned this to you the last time. We were moving forward and, and moving toward a target date 
Um, and then we have the employee advisory group, which is a group that I meet with from across the organization. And they brought some issues to my attention in that conversation. And those were issues that we definitely needed to take into account in terms of the reopening. Um, it was great feedback. And that's actually why we utilize the employee advisory group is to get that feedback and make sure that we're accounting for everything that they're concerned with. Because as you look at reopening, you have to ensure, and I've said this before, the safety of the residents of our community and what they're expecting. But we also have a lot of employees that, that want to see the same thing in terms of what they're asked to do when they come to work. So we had to work through a number of issues, um, which delayed us a little bit. And then based on that feedback, um, what we're thinking right now, and this is assuming that there's no significant change in orders, is that on May 27th, we're going to do what we call a soft opening. And that's where we bring folks back into work. Um, in a lot of cases, many of these individuals um, have been working from home. And so we wanted people to get the chance to acclimate. How do we wear a mask in the buildings? Where do we wear a mask? And to ensure that our reopening plans are appropriate. And then we're tentatively looking for a June 1st um, opening um, again, and that's to the public. So we want to give three days for staff to come in and work and then um, a public opening on June 1st, but that's only for the Civic Center, the Development Service Center, um, Municipal Court, and the Service Center. If you remember, those were the last four buildings that we actually had the ability to, that were still open before the final stay at home order. In addition, we're also looking at other components of operations, um, and you'll see um, curbside um, service at the library in the near future. And so it won't be that the library is open. Those are actually still, we're, we're being advised closed uh, via the state order, but we're trying to open up components that still meet the intent of the orders and continue to move forward. Um, finally, um, as you all know, Jim talked to you about the budget. And so we're still working through a number of budget issues. Um, and you remember his estimate. So we're trying to deal with budget issues related to this year. Um, we're also moving into the budget for next year. And we're gonna be watching numbers real time, month to month to see what it looks like in terms of the impact. But as we start thinking about what we're going to do as an organization, I think the thing we have to be really cognizant of um, is that this is probably going to be the tightest budget um, that the council's had to deal with and that we've had to deal with probably since the 08 recession. And, and so it will impact, um, you know, the things that we do and how we do those over time. And, and so I just wanted to keep, I'm going to keep talking about that as we're moving through it, because that is going to be a significant issue for us to deal with as an organization, um, not only for this year's budget, but for next year's budget. If you listen to any number of economists, you know, there's a, not a lot of clarity in terms of the recession, uh, but I'm hearing that it is more than likely going to extend to the end of 2021. That's one thing I'm hearing. The other is mid 2021, no matter what that answer is, we know that it's going to potentially impact our 2021 budget. So we're going to be looking at actuals and then making assumptions for what the recession will look like um, and then move into our budget process. Just to let you know, um, some of the direction that I've given to staff is we have our um, level one request, and those are essentially must pay, must pay items that exist within our budget. Um, have limited to level level two to a a limited number. I think it's no more than four, but they really need to be um, directly related to providing ongoing services in terms of what we're doing. Um, but it's again just to reiterate with council, it's going to be a, a significant challenge as we move into this budget year. And so when we're thinking about the things we're doing, we just need to keep that in mind. Other than that, um, that is my COVID update. Um, there's not a lot this time, but I think there will be more um, after the 25th when we start seeing the next round of orders being released. Are there any questions? That's fair, Pat. Your hand is up first. There, finally unmuted. 
Um, I just want to voice my frustration with the baseball fields not being open. I understand um, the whole idea about the team sports and being able to uh, social distance, et cetera. But um, it seems like volleyball is as well as, well as a team sport um, when you're playing competitive volleyball, um, as well as tennis uh, when, you're, when you're doing um, doubles. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just I am just concerned about the level of activities that we take away from kids who've been uh, been housed for three or four months, and um, this is a huge huge activity. Actually, it's a pretty good revenue source as well for the city if you want to look at it that way. So. Right. That is the very um, statement and question that I put in that in, in, in a meeting that we had last Thursday uh, that we're trying to track down. Um, even when as far as saying, you know, if 10 people can gather, what's the difference? And so that's what we're trying to get clarity on. It's in this case, the order is very specific to team sports. And so that's what we're having to manage. Okay, but hopefully we'll get an answer. We're, we're working it because it's all of the issues you talked about. Thank you. Let me go back. Thanks, Mayor Begley. Uh, Harold, at what point, um, I'm not certain, well, I'm certain, but I'm not real clear on the criteria, the threshold we've met or passed uh, that, that triggered the uh, emergency declaration. It was... It was no doubt to me then, nor has it been since, that we were managing a crisis uh, or an emergency. Uh, but as we now, the question is, what's the, what's the threshold that we either meet or fall below that would cause us to say, we're no longer under a, an emergency declaration. Uh, we're still managing many crises, but we do that every day, all the time, right? That's part of the job of managers. Um, What's the, what are the criteria that, that we should be thinking about that you're going to be using? Does that camp come back to us for a formal action? That we say, as of tomorrow or as of some date, we're no longer operating under an emergency declaration. How does that, um, how do we get, how do we transition out of that? Um, so generally, um, typically in, a, in any event, what you look at is when, you are no longer operationally overwhelmed by the event itself. And what, what you, you use to trigger the disaster de- declaration is when the event exceeds the capacity of the organization to deal with the event and the ongoing operations that you have to deal with to keep the city running. And, and so that is the highest level of trigger that we have to deal with. The other thing that comes into play is really also tied into some of these other orders that are being issued um, now really more by the state level and what that means to us in terms of how we operate, what are the restrictions that we put that are put on ourselves um, in in those issues. And so that'll be another component that we look at uh, in terms of making that decision. Um, But it's really those two issues that are going to drive that conversation. So what were so what would be translate those conditions into what we do or what you bring us or do you bring us anything at what at what point I, I would bring it to I would personally bring it to council and say here's where we are and here's what we here's where we think we're going to be and we're at a point where we can effectively manage our ongoing operations all of the items that we have to work on and this event itself um, and, 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 and granted, not everything's going to be there. I mean, it's similar to the flood. Yeah. When we had the flood, not everyone was, was out of the woods on that. Um, so you, that, that, would be, works. that would be a recommendation you bring to us for action or consensus? or I typically bring it for a consensus to go, here's what I'm seeing. That's just the way I approach it oh, okay. uh, generally. Thanks. But not everybody's going to be out of the fire in some cases. I think two people have their hands up. 
Council Member Farring and Council Member Farring. Farring. Okay, so um, you had talked about some of the issues that the employee advisory group had brought up. What were some of the specifics that? Uh, I think generally there were questions in terms of, you know, how are we um, handling creating a safe working environment, whether it's plexiglass and when you would interact with the public, how are we going to handle masking? Um, it was also issues, how do you deal with coworkers who are failing to wear their mask? How do you deal with the public that's failing to wear their, you know, that's not doing this? Mm -hmm. um, and then they brought up individual issues related to their workplace. Some of it was just needing to have more clarity. So every one of the directors have been meeting with all of their folks that are going to be part of the opening and talking them through, this is what it's going to look like. This is how we're going to do it. So part of it was really just making sure everyone understood what the situation was going to be like. Um, for those of us that have been working, it's a much different perspective mm -hmm. uh, because we've been in it versus those who haven't been working. And so it was really closing a lot of those gaps and giving people the opportunity to really talk about what were their worst fears and their best hopes. Mm -hmm. um, because to the point that I made to my team and that we talked about is we can drive into a date but if everyone's not really on board with that and there's still questions or concerns, then that's gonna create other issues for us. And so what we were trying to do is take a, a true collaborative approach to make sure people were comfortable with the plan. Now, not everybody's gonna be comfortable, um, but we were trying to deal with as many issues as we possibly could. Also then basing it on what the governor's doing in terms of what they're releasing and how they're releasing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nuances in this, things like rec centers and swimming pools. I mean, those are still closed via the orders. And, and so we have, you know, obviously we can't do that. Yeah. Um, but then even when they can open them, there are different restrictions in terms of the numbers that people can get in there. So typically in a gym component, um, the number's not 10, it's four. Um, and it's personal training. And then we found out late, late last week that we thought, well, that could apply to swimming, to lap swimming. Well, they actually, we thought 10 could apply to lap swimming. They actually said no, um, and then told us swimming pools are closed generally um, via these orders. Um, so those are the nuances that we get into, but it's really just making sure everyone's comfortable. Okay. And so I guess that's another reason why it's really important that we have concrete guidelines that are consistent Correct. Board, um, and in line with the messaging we're hearing from our governor and our county. Um, yeah, and then one of the other things, and this was something that was brought up to me by a constituent, and I had seen, I think Denver is doing something about closing off certain sections of roads to allow for outside seating of restaurants. Has the city looked at some of those options? Is that something feasible to get businesses open a little sooner? Joni, um, Kimberly's on, but I know Joni and Kimberly and Jessica and Scott Cook and, and, our, and, our, and our business group that, that we talked about that has presented to you, they are in the middle of that issue. Okay. Um, also working on the licensing issues that are going to be associated with that because it will create different venues. So yeah, we're working on that. We're okay. hoping to hear the guidance so that we will be ready for options You know, once we start getting clarity. Okay, and I do have other questions, but I think it's more in line with the ordinance that will be okay. later. I think Council Member Peck had a question. Council Member Peck, did you hand up? No, I don't think so. I think that's it. Anybody else? Okay. All right, who else? All right, let's move on then to first call public invited to be heard. Um, Don, can we go ahead and do that? All right, for those, of you, for those of you who want to call in, uh, go ahead and please dial 1 669 and enter the ID code. So let's go ahead and uh, wait 60 seconds. You're on there now, by the way.
Mayor, just while we're waiting for people to dial in, are you prepared to time people tonight? Yep. Okay. I read your lips. All right, who's in the queue? Don, how many we got? Mayor, it looks like we have one person that called in. All right, well, there's another there's one here. Two, there's another one, yep. All right, you wanna go ahead and call them out? We've got three people, four people. Oh, they're starting to pop in. Yeah, if you just give me a minute, we'll let them all queue up and, um, and then I'll uh, start them this way. Uh, the screen is still showing on the live stream. So when that ends, then we can begin. And you will admit them, Susan? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. All right, so it looks like the screen just uh, came down from the live stream. And I'll admit them all. Mayor, did you want to close the public invited to be heard so I can um, lock the meeting? Sorry, muted again. Yeah, let's go ahead and close it, lock it out. Okay. Those looks like there's four people. Oh, wait, no, six people. Six. All right, let's go for it. Let's lock it up. Okay, guests, um, we've got quite a few of you. I will begin by introducing you by calling out the last three digits of your phone number and I'll unmute you at that time and you can give us your name and address and you'll have three minutes. Guest that ends in 536, can you hear us? Yeah. Hello. Hi, good evening. Hi. Go ahead and state name your name. Go ahead. Thanks. I'm Gabriel Schmid, and I live at 1060 Kane Drive. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, I can hear you. Would you like to speak on public invited to be yeah. heard? Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I am one of the many teens and others who are using the jumps at Left Hand Creek Park. I am very grateful to hear today what they are holding off till the end of the year project to restore the Creek Park. We found out from the, some of the neighborhoods in this area that uh, people have been using this since the late 90s. Those who use these ride jumps for the last seven to more recent years. Okay. Is that all? Yep. No, I was still going to go. I just was oh, kind of keep going. Sorry. Okay. Um, on a visit of the park, you would see different races and participants working together to uh, bring this um, to a fun park where there's multiple jumps. In a short 200 meter span, we built 10 jumps and that go from one to another, easy to difficult. There are side paths for younger kids who do not uh, can't ride those jumps. In four days, we've raised five hundred dollars on Change.org to add to the simple track or bike jumps um, to on one of the existing parks in South Longmont. We are hoping that the city can open up a space where we can uh, help um, alongside uh, city park members to build um, uh, public jumps. We know that this is important because of um, that when kids are able to give the opportunity 
to um, to uh, uh, be able to make jumps. They give ownership and responsibility to these jumps and uh, take care of it. And so we would like to put together something where we can raise money to um, rent equipment or stuff that is needed that the city needs since we are on a tight budget right now. Is that all? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Let's thank go. you. All right. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 663. I'm going to unmute you. If you can, please state your name and address. Clark Allen, Twin Peaks Circle, Long Lot. Longmont continues to have the highest rate of COVID-19 cases in Boulder County. I personally never want to be one who infects someone else and causes their death. So if wearing a mask will help, then I will wear a mask. There are really four components to mitigating the spread of COVID-19. One, personal hygiene, washing your hands eight to 10 times a day. Second, wearing a mask when in public, even if you are practicing social distancing. You never know when you will encounter someone while biking, running, or walking when you cannot maintain six feet of distance. Most bicycle paths are not eight feet wide. Third, participate in practicing social distancing when in public. If you can't maintain six feet of distance when running, biking, or walking, you may have to wait to pass or get off your bike to let others pass safely with six feet of distance. Finally, stay at home if you have any symptoms associated with COVID-19. There are existing apps that will quiz you about your health and help guide you make the decision about going out. Along alone, these practices will not stop the spread of COVID-19 themselves. Together, they are like a, a drug cocktail that has been used to effectively attack diseases. It works for SARS. Putting all of these together will lock down the virus. These steps have been effectively used at Brigham and Williams Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts a hospital of more than 70,000 people with minimum infection rates. The city council should consider passing a resolution adopting these practices as we move forward to open the city for citizens and for the citizens of Longmont and help to get Longmont out of the dubious position of being number one in Boulder County for COVID-19 cases. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, next. Our next caller, your number ends in 722. I'm going to unmute you. Please state your name and your address, please. Can you hear us? Yes. My name is Lynette McLean, and I live on Sandpoint Drive in Longmont. According to the field inspection by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Committee, the COGCC, dated April 22nd, 2020, there's a leak at the stamp well located very near Union Reservoir. City Deputy City Manager, City Deputy City Manager Dale Rademacher assured the City Council in a recent Council session that everything was fine with the stamp well and that there were no leaks. When he knew this was not true, this well has had many problems with leaks and groundwater contamination in the past. COGCC records show that the well was stimulated in December and based on a rig scene at the site was also stimulated in March. The well has also been producing recently without doing the required mechanical integrity testing 30 days in advance of any activity. The well has been flaring late at night, which aligns with the data from the air quality measures done by Dr. Helmick on March 30th, 2020. The workovers in December and March are not in accordance with the city's contract with the oil company who owns this well. The Times call is also complicit in misrepresenting the activity at the stamp well. Please investigate this and stop this activity to keep our air and water safe. 
Also, please sanction city staff like, Do like Mr. Rademacher, who are not being transparent about this dangerous issue. You may refer to Karen Dyke's editorial, which was submitted to the Times Call, but not printed by them, but was, all, was in the Long Run Observer for further information about the recent workover activity in this abandoned well site. I am going to send Karen's editorial and the photo of the stamp well referenced in the editorial, along with the field inspection report that I referenced to, and all of the city, to, to all the city council members. My final ask is please work with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Committee to determine if there is groundwater contamination that might flow into Union Reservoir. Thanks. Thanks for that. All right, let's go on to the next one. The next caller, your phone number ends in 826. You have been unmuted. Can you hear us? Can you please state your name and address for the record? Hello, I'm Sean McKell, 1122 Button Rock Drive. And uh, just uh, calling about the whole COVID situation. I'm just curious, generally how people, how, many, how much people have gotten to of all the different data and different perspectives on this whole thing because it seems like it's overblown to me in the end where there's a lot of people who have gotten it but haven't had much symptoms and we've, <clears throat> I can understand at the beginning since we didn't know what was going on to lock things down maybe but after, if we'd be truthful to the data that's out there amongst everywhere. For example, I saw one chart where the states that are locked down more um, have actually had worse situation with it compared with the stations that have locked down, have removed their lockdowns, have been locked down less. And I'm, you gotta, everybody's, you know, viruses, you can't fix them necessarily. The flu virus, it mutates and comes back, comes and goes and all that, for example. And I think if we look at all the data, it'll show that the COVID will have been about the same as the flu virus, maybe a little bit worse, but not in a great amount. So I'm thinking we need to open things up more to let people, let it circulate amongst people that are reasonably healthy. Those that are old and have problems, sure, they maybe help them to stay safe, but we need to get everybody infected so that we can allow the older people to get out because there will be few, the virus will be under control more and uh, fewer people getting it. Or I mean, people have already gotten it, so they won't be spreading it anymore. And uh, that will allow the economy to go. You know, that's, that's the greatest amazing uh, thing about this whole uh, COVID is the economy, economic destruction that's happened. So might, one might say, oh, you're selfish. You don't care about people that might die. Well, how about being selfish and destroying people's economic lives? So that's my point. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have two more in the queue. The actual. I didn't hear the phone. Oh, do we miss one? Sorry, I was muted, Mayor. Caller 369, you're next. Please state your name and address. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. My name is Gretchen Schmid at 1060 Kane Drive, Southmore Park neighborhood, South Longmont. And um, I was calling in today um, first with a, a different plan, but then I had a great conversation with Timber, the park superintendent, um, who had planned to level the jumps that the kids have been riding on for the last 30 years over by Creekside, over by the creek and Creekside Park. And we had a great conversation um, talking about how the city has really been racking their brains about how to help the situation and how to also meet the demands of restoring the creek bank. And um, I just really hope from this, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm and uh, support among the youth in this south central area, I guess. I'm not sure if you would call us uh, all the neighborhoods that border Pike. There's kids from all those neighborhoods who use that jump 
and we've learned in the last week that it's been happening for a lot longer than than these kids have been doing it. Um, but we talked about some of the expansive areas in some of our parks right around here. Kanemoto Park, even Creekside Park, has area, large areas of grass. These kids have been getting miles and miles of enjoyment out of a 200 meter span where they built 10 jumps very effectively. And so we, Timber and I kind of spoke and brainstormed about what could that look like for the city to collaborate with uh, liaisons of the community in this area. And, you know, the kids on change.org, they raised $500 just over the weekend. You know, what would that look like to, and over 2,000 signatures, to, uh, to help pay for the heavy equipment to come in and maybe a corner of Kinamoto expansive grass area that's never used. We're always over at the park. There's, there's areas that are not used and um, have the city do the part of doing some contouring and the kids are experts with their shovels to do the crafting and actually making the jumps. So this has been such a great benefit during the quarantine. They've been on their bikes. They've been keeping the area free of trash. Um, yes, there is concern about the floodplain, but um, you know, my question now, you know, being grateful that everything was postponed till the end of the year so they can have this for the rest of the spring and over the summer and the fall, um, how, you know, the, the possibility of, of um, there's many supportive parents who mm -hmm. I believe could create um, a coalition to, to collaborate with the applicable city superintendent managers, you know, the, the, those who would be doing the work and, you know, to create a little track, you know, in, in one of our parks right here, uh, we are all not really up for sending our kids down the path um, to the east where it goes under 287 there's been several adults that have been attacked by homeless on that path and they're not going to go back um to that dix one that was created there's four jumps they're all really spaced out um there is a book by mr louvre last child left in the woods and he talks about how it's actually been proven when we engage the youth in actually actual creation of the of, of parks and not just say here's your park it was created by the professionals, but when the youth are engaged, that they actually have ownership and they take responsibility and they want to take part in it. They want to take a part of keeping it nice and being responsible. And that's what these kids have shown over at Creekside. I'm going to have to cut you off. Thank well, over three minutes, but thank you. All right. And then the last person in the queue. Caller, your number ends in 697. 697, you're unmuted. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Go ahead and this state is, your name. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, this is Kathy Hart again. I live on Kentmere Drive in uh, here in Longmont. And uh, I've been watching the meeting today, and the reason I'm calling is with regard to granting the city um, the authority or the broad brush authority to require um, PPE in an emergency situation. And as I'm listening to the meeting tonight, um, I, I'm thinking about the fact that I just read earlier today that Colorado was already running out of unemployment funds, which means we're going to have to borrow federal funding. Um, I'm hearing that there is significant work to do to help businesses uh, be creative and figure out ways to protect their employees and their customers and what's that going to look like, um, and I'm hearing, uh, and I'm reading that you guys are focusing energy on trying to decide um, about voting for this broad brush approach to allow city council to have an authority over mandating and even possibly arresting and fining citizens for not wearing masks. And my concern is, one, we already have state rules recommendations. We also have Boulder County rules and regulations. I'm just curious why it is that the council feels it's pertinent to spend time on something like passing that type of an ordinance when you should be focusing on helping businesses get back open so that we can get people off of unemployment and remove the debt that the
state government is going to have to take on from the federal government if we can't get businesses back open. Thank you. All right, that will conclude first call, public invited to be heard. Let's move on to, everybody doing okay? We've been going less than an hour, or actually, you guys have been here. I've been going less than an hour. You guys have been going about an hour. You guys want a break? Are we okay? Right, let's go ahead, just do, let's do the consent agenda, and then we'll, we'll go on to ordinances on second reading. All right, Don, you want to read that one resolution 8A? You betcha, Mayor. Uh, resolution right, hold, on. We lost hold, one. hold on, hold on, here, here, go. You lost a council member. Oh, we're back. He's getting water. Do you want to take a break? No, I needed to fill up my water. <laughs> All right, stay hydrated. Go hard. All right, cool. All right, let's go ahead, Don. Mayor, item 8A on the consent agenda is resolution 2020-43, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the first restated and amended intergovernmental agreement between the city, Boulder County, and the city of Boulder for cost sharing for the COVID-19 Recovery Center for the homeless. All right, do we have a motion, Councilman Martin? I move the consent agenda. Second. All right, the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Seeing no further debate or discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, resolution 2020-43 passes unanimously. Let's move on to ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. At this time, we go ahead and throw up the dial-in number again, please, Susan. We'd ask that members of the public who would like to call in regarding ordinance 2020-23, a bill for an ordinance amending section 1008-180 of the Walmart Municipal Code on Disaster and Emergency Orders, that you call in now. So we will go ahead and start. Um, first of all, uh, let's move on to that, which I just read. Do we have a motion? Hold on a second, I lost the screen. All right, Councilmember Martin? Um, yes, I, I can't see the number, but I, I, I moved the motion just read. All right, one second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Joan. All right, uh, let's go ahead and open it for the public hearing. Is there anybody in the queue? Mayor, it hasn't been quite a minute that it's been on the screen yet. All right. We do have uh, one new guest, and we have the last guest that I put in the waiting room is uh, has not hung up, so I will check in with them as well. I don't know why, but my Joan's on my screen. Big. Hi, Joan. All right, let's go ahead and put it back up. All righty. Uh, let's go ahead and open this up for public hearing. Do you want to read them in, please? Okay, we've got two callers. One caller, uh, you are returning. I, uh, you spoke previously. And I've brought you back into the meeting. Your phone number ends in 826. I'm going to unmute you. Did you want to speak at this public hearing? Let's go on the next one. Caller, your phone number ends in 082. I'm going to unmute you if you can. State your name and address for the record. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name and address? Yes, please. Patrick Munson. I'm at uh, 2201 Emory Street. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, this is just comments for the city council. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, I don't understand why there's such a continuation of wearing the masks 
and the social distancing when there's hundreds of immunologists all over the internet saying this is suppressing the immune system. I've studied natural health for 25 years. I've raised three kids without doctors because their immune systems were able to develop naturally. Keeping masks on healthy people is very unhealthy. Dr. Fauci even says this. The, CD, the World Health Organization is now saying it's unhealthy for healthy people to be wearing masks. Second point is the city of Longmont has no delegated authority in the Constitution of Colorado to put any sort of limits on people. You are a private for-profit corporation on Dun and Bradstreet. You have Dunn's number. You have QCIP numbers. You don't have the authority to tell anybody they have to wear a mask or they have to do anything. The only authority you have is if somebody breaks a law that violates somebody else's rights. So this whole thing is ridiculous. I don't know if you're aware, but the state of Wisconsin Supreme Court just ruled all this stuff unconstitutional. They're completely open now. And I believe Oregon did this same thing. It's going to happen state after state after state. And I've already got several people in the county that are very eager, eager to join a class action lawsuit to sue the state, the governor, whoever needs to be. And I'm telling you right now, if you continue suppressing our rights, the city of Longmont's going to get sued. And if you violate the law, which you've already done that, you've violated the Constitution, you have violated U.S. Code Section 242 in Title 18, which is uh, violating protected rights under the color of law. That's a federal law that you have violated. So we have every reason and uh, right to pursue suing the city of Longmont in federal court. I've looked up the, the uh, legal standing. It's there. The legal precedence is there. And because if the city council members violate the law, they lose their immunity from lawsuit. So you better do the right thing for the people because you can be open to lawsuit in your individual capacities. That's all I have to say, and I'm not threatening anybody. I'm just being very serious and telling you the way things are. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. That will conclude, uh, that will conclude our public hearing on this matter. Um, is that a hand, Councilmember Lara Faring? It's good you. Yes, it is. Hold on. You, mute, you muted yourself. Yes, I did the little space bar, but it's too long to hold. So a couple of things. One of the things in the ordinance on page um, 27 of the actual document, not the whole packet, um, compromised, is it comprised or compromised? I think that might be a typo. I saw the same. What? It's definitely a typo. Okay. So that would need to be corrected. And then the other thing is, um, where did this, I think we did talk about this before. I can't, uh, I don't, I didn't have it written down. Um, this verbiage, where did it come from? Was it cut from another document, existing document and placed into this uh, particular emergency ordinance? Did you? Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney, I, I do believe we uh, plagiarized this from some other uh, emergency PPE ordinance within the state. Okay. Um, and so specifically, the purpose of this, so I mean, in my, in my, what I had intended was that because we have a portion of Longmont that is Weld County, Rather than having a patchwork or different um, guidelines, depending on where you're at in Longmont, 
it it was just it seems like it's a in much better um, to have concrete set um, guidelines set throughout the city of Longmont. We had already adopted um, the belief, the statement that we would support the governor's ordinances and guidelines, as well as the um, Boulder counties. Um, and also too, I was made aware this evening or this afternoon at a, um, at a school district union meeting that the um, St. Fran Valley School District is also utilizing and supporting and go going through Boulder County's guidelines. Even though we have a portion of the St. Fran Valley School District that is Weld County, we are under that same, um, that same umbrella and under their guidelines. So for consistency's sake, I had wanted, what I had wanted to see was just what we as, a, as Boulder County, what Boulder County has recommended, we as the city would adopt and recommend that as well. Um, so as far as the wording on this, rather than having it be, because it, it is kind of subjective, like wh who is determining imminent danger? Where is that coming from? Is it something that is implied? Is it set through Boulder County? Is it through the governor? Is it um, us as we deem necessary? So should we have an, um, a particular amendment or stipulation on here is who is guiding, who is determining what is that imminent danger? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Susie, then we're going to go with Councilor Martin and John and Paul. Okay. And then I have another question, but I'll do that later. Go ahead. You're in the queue. Go ahead. Okay. So, th so that was one section of it. And then um, the other one was in regard to masks. You know, we've heard a lot of comments about the dangers, the risks of masks. Um, I'd like to know what research supports or that notion that the masks are dangerous, that we shouldn't be wearing them, uh, we are inhaling too much CO2. So where, where is the research that supports those claims? And what is the research telling us? Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. So in terms of the, the CO2 issue, so um, I've had some conversations with Boulder County Health on, the, on this issue today. They were getting some similar questions on this issue. Um, and um, at this point, they're continuing to dig through the research um, in terms of the sources that they're looking at on the CO2 issue. Um, there's different sources, but in, in terms of being associated with um, the Royal Academy, for one, which I have up here, and I will send you some of these documents. They're not necessarily seeing that. Um, I think it also depends on the type of mask. Um, so anticipating some of the questions, I also talked mm -hmm. uh, to a family member who works at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati and asked this question. Um, and, and they're requiring um, people to wear masks coming into the facility. Typically, one of the articles that I read in terms of wearing masks for long periods of time, surgeons do it, doctors do it, different professions have to wear those, and, and they haven't seen evidence in those professions in terms of that. Now, what they did say, the N95s that are more form-fitting on your face, if you read the research, that, that may have different issues, but it's not the same type of mask in terms of the cloth mask or the surgical mask. Um, and there's completely different issues, but even then, uh, the medical staff wear those for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. So at, at this point, I haven't been able to find anything on that issue. Mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you is um, that the World Health Organization, in a document that they had, and, and this really gets to the, to the heart of the issue, if you look at it, there's two things on the, on the World Health Organization talking about, does it protect you? Well, that's a different question than versus does it protect someone else? And the guidance at the World Health Organization, the CDC and the Surgeon General have all said is, these masks are designed to 
protect someone else in terms of reducing the droplets. Um, and specifically, the World Health Organization says studies of influenza, influenza-like illnesses, and human coronaviruses provide evidence that the use of medical masks, cough mask, and other studies can prevent the spread of infectious droplets from an infected person to someone else in potential contamination of the environment by these droplets. Um, the, um, the Royal Society um, also looked at this, and they were looking for evidence supporting the potential effectiveness and they analyzed several things. One, the incidence of asymptomatic and presymptomatic transmission, the role of respiratory droplets in transmission, which can travel one to two meters, studies of the use of homemade surgical masks to reduce droplets so spread. Um, and they said that their analysis su suggests that their use could reduce onward transmission by asymptomatic and presymptomatic wearers if widely used in situations where physical distancing is not possible or predictable. And I think that's a key point in this, because if you look at the Boulder County order on masking, the first thing that they say is physical distance, mm -hmm. you know, six feet, six to 10 feet from each other. It then says, if you can't achieve that physical distancing, then you wear the mask. And that's really the crux of the issue. When you can't, physical, when you can't physically distance yourself from someone else, you wear this so that the droplets are actually more contained versus, in, you know, if you're not wearing it. And then in other documents that they really talk about, it's the, the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transition that they're seeing, transmission that they're seeing in the numbers that comes into play in some of these guidance documents where that is part of the recommendation. Probably gave you more information than you needed, but no, I it's think kind so. of what we're looking at. And there's other studies that I can send to council. Okay. And, you know, as far as, and I guess this would go geared towards more towards Eugene, um, but, you know, I look back when I hear the idea, the notion that it's unconstitutional, um, you know, I, refer, I look back at um, the February 20th, um, 1905 Supreme Court case, Jacobson versus uh, Massachusetts, and that um, the court, Supreme Court did reject his claim, and it was, it was around the um, smallpox vaccine, claiming that it was a violation of liberty. Um, and it was deemed, so according to Justice John Marshall Harlan, um, he wrote about the police power of states to regulate the protection of public health. The good and welfare of the Commonwealth, of which the legislature is primarily the judge, is the basis of which the police power rests in mass. In that case, it was in Massachusetts. So Harlan said, um, upon the principle of self-defense of paramount necessity, a community has the right to protect itself from an epidemic of disease which threatens the safety of its measure, of its um, members. And so this case is still being looked at at the scholarly level, but also too in, in the matter of public health um, protections especially with the threat of pandemics. So again, I don't feel like we're kind of out of line as far as constitutional rights go with this if we are looking at the safety of public health. All right, Councilman Martin? Actually, was that right said? I think it said yes. John Paul, right? Okay. Yeah, so thank you. So there's a few points that I want to make um, from uh, the, the speaker we just heard. I've been hearing from a lot of people who had essentially the same talking points and some other people who just had some genuine confusions. So first, um, we, we just want to say that intensified mask wearing is in fact a measure that is for reopening, mm -hmm. not for flattening the curve. Um, when you're flattening the curve, you don't need masks because you're staying at home. Uh, so, you know, people are just getting confused about why we're doing this, and we're doing this so that we can safely reopen. Um, the second thing uh, is, is that, uh, that we aren't really calling for any of this long-term continuous mask wearing, or I have to put on a mask if I'm just going to step into my front yard, or walk my dog, um, you know, uh, a block down the street. Um, 
the you should have a mask with you if you're going to walk your dog anywhere, but you shouldn't have to wear the mask unless you encounter a crowd, in which case you should put on your mask. Um, so uh, all this stuff about whether um, uh, you're going to hurt your own health by not getting enough oxygen or getting too much CO2 or um, your mask getting disgusting. If you wash your mask, it won't get disgusting. Um, and uh, so we need, we need to look at this in the kind of proportion that we have. Uh, finally, the idea that, um, uh, that we're, um, uh, the, the emergency order that we're talking about, that giving the city manager uh, the power to uh, in step up the use of PPP PPE required in the city, um, it does not automatically mean that uh, if we pass this, he's going to say, uh, everybody has to wear a mask now. Um, what this is, is just extending the emergency capabilities that the city manager naturally has uh, when we are in a state of emergency. So this, the reason that we're doing this is that so if we should have a sudden uptick in, in, in infections, the city manager could do something in 15 minutes, whereas it would, if we had to start with a city council action, it would take three weeks. We don't have three weeks if we're getting a sudden uptick in infections or all of a sudden the hospitals are overwhelmed. And this has happened in other places where they thought they had things under control, they reopen, and then all of a sudden there was a, a, a reversal. So all of this is doing is just filling a, a little gap in the emergency order that we already had and that the council already ratified. Um, to affirm that we need someone who can act quickly, able to act quickly, and who, by the way, is always every single day in touch with Boulder County Health and the state uh, health department. So it's not like this, there's this amateur out there um, calling the shots. I just want to defend what we're, what we're doing here. And finally, I would like to say that the source of all the talking points about constitutional Constitutionality and weakened immune systems and um, all of that stuff. I mean, there is something that if you were kept in a bubble your entire life, you would have a weakened immune system. But a little bit of mask wearing uh, is not going to have that effect if you have a normal immune system that is developed over your life. Um, all of those talking points come from a website called Citizens for Free Speech. Um, and it is maintained by former neurosurgeon, um, Dr. Russell, Bo or former doctor, I think, Russell Blaylock, who is a well-known 20-year conspiracy theorist. Um, I don't give a lot of credence to what he says, and um, I think people should do their own research. So I am going to support this. Um, it's just filling a little gap in, the, in our safety net right now during this time. You're next. Did you want to go? I do. Thank you. I was on. I didn't hear you. So uh, I want to thank both of the previous council women on their uh, comments. I agree with them. Um, the other thing that, according to a lot of the emails that went out to all of council, they weren't. Uh, it was pretty much a blank slate that, they, that a lot of those emails went out, that the, the common theme in some of them was, if you are sick, stay home. I want to remind people that you can be infected before you know you are going to be ill, and that is the problem with this, is that you do not have the symptoms even though you're infected, which brings it on the two-week or 14-day uh, quarantine period. I also want to give a little uh, background in that when I was a little girl, we had a we had another huge, huge epidemic uh, pandemic, I guess, of a of a disease, and it was called polio. 
We had to wear masks. Everything was shut down in the summer. All the swimming pools, people were kept in and told to be quiet during the middle of the day when it's hot. It was very scary. And I, I, you know, I remember my parents, they were constantly talking about what to do. And, and this epidemic reminds me of that in that we did not know, our parents did not know the total effect of polio. And we don't know that either, the unintended consequences of this virus. We are seeing some things come out um, as far as uh, the immune system overreacting in some kids. And they think that it might be related to coronavirus, but nobody really knows at this point. We're still learning. And I want to reiterate Councilwoman Martin's uh, statement that we are saying we want to reopen this economy. And in order to do it, we need to follow some of the statements that are made by Boulder County and the governor's uh, protocols. I was reading, you know, when I read uh, the italicized part in this, in this ordinance or this code, I'm sorry, it's not an ordinance. I was a little concerned that the word mask was never put in here. And it, it sounds a bit overreaching because we use words that are honestly kind of scary, biological, chemical, radio, physical, electrical, mechanical, but we never say anything about uh, masks. I know this came up last week and you said that was covered in the, the uh, PPE portion, but um, in fact, if I think that if we're going to say something in here about all of these um, result from where this can result from, we should also put in some wording about uh, viruses or uh, pandemics or um, something that actually relates to what we're doing today and why we are bringing this up. So uh, those are my comments. I do support this. It does sound a bit overreaching and I can understand that. But I also uh, want the public to know that the reason for this from my perspective is that we cannot, when there's, when we have to act quickly, we cannot call a city council meeting on every single issue. We have got to give some power to the person who actually runs our city, who is uh, our city manager. Um, so for me, that this is huge. And if we didn't have the ability to put power in the city manager's hands, who knows where we would have been during the flood. So um, I do support this and I thank the other counselors for their comments. Remember, uh, Christensen. Sorry. Um, I, I want to also thank uh, Councilwoman uh, Hidalgo Faring and um, Councilmember Martin for really intelligent um, points that actually our job is to try to explain this to the public and also, of course, for Councilwoman Peck's intelligent remarks. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Susie for reading out loud the, the discussion that the Supreme Court had. Um, to me, there is really nothing more key to being a public official than to protect the health and safety of uh, our lawyer citizens, our residents of the city. And this is a worldwide pandemic. This is clearly an emergency. And uh, as Councilwoman Peck said, we have to be able to act quickly. And as a council, we are supposed to be doing policy. Well, our policy is to turn over the um, decisions on a day-to-day -day basis to the person in our city that city council chose and city council supports, and that would be the city manager who has a great deal of experience and skill and connections mm -hmm. and is far more um, suited to making these day-to-day -day decisions um, than, than all the rest of us probably put together. And so I, people who think that uh, somehow um, Mr. Dominguez is going to 
seize power and go haywire, um, that isn't going to happen. He isn't a pol politician and uh, that's a good thing. We need to listen to doctors, scientists, and people, healthcare workers, uh, not politicians. My dad used to have a sign over his uh, shop that said, your rights end where my nose begins. And I think that's good to us to remember. I do not have the right to run around and threaten you. I don't have the right to run around and infect you. So I am perfectly willing to be uncomfortable and it is uncomfortable and it, and it is annoying. We all know that. Um, but it's not as annoying as my neighbor Yvonne, who's on the Longmont United Health COVID uh, ward uh, periodically because she's a nurse and she has to wear huge amounts of protective equipment every time she's on this and, it's, and she has to wear it for her whole shift, which is very long. So what we're being asked to do is just to protect each other. And as uh, Councilman Martin said a few weeks ago, the, uh, much of the information that is coming from this website, and thank you for telling us uh, who's sponsoring this because it clearly comes from one, in one website, um, um, is misinformed. And partly people do not understand that this is, as Councilwoman Martin said several weeks ago, they're asking a different question. This is not to keep us from getting it. Masking is to keep us from giving it. Because we don't have sufficient testing or haven't up until now, we have no idea who has it. Um, and so all of us need to do this uh, to protect each other. Um, uh, this is, people ask us why we need to do this when Boulder County already has this. Well, it's because the city of Longmont also is in Weld County. So we need to be able to control that part of our city that is in Weld County, which does not, is not doing any of these protective measures or was not last time I checked. And that's the reason, if this seems overreaching, it's because we are trying to reach or branch, bridge <laughs> um, two counties. And that's because our city, unfortunately, does bridge two counties. So we had to do this uh, in order to take care of that part of things. Um, okay, maybe that's all I need to say right now. I, I just, I really appreciate what, what Clark Allen had to say. That was very, it was very intelligent. These, each one of these, comparing it to a drug cocktail, which is what people use for AIDS now, there was never any silver bullet for AIDS or for many diseases. They have to be taken care of with a little thing here and a little thing here and a little thing here and another intervention. And together, all those interventions help substantially. So washing your hands and distancing and staying home are obviously the most effective things, but we're not gonna stay home forever. We can't. So when we're out in public, we need to wear a mask if we can't stay six feet apart. We already, and as, as Councilwoman Martin said, this is how we open up. This, we're not imposing this to put more restrictions on people. We're, we're, we're doing this so that we can get back to operating our businesses on some kind of sensible level. I can go to the grocery store and almost everyone has a mask on and we give each other a lot of room. I can go down to the flower bin and buy my seeds for lettuce and beets and my starters and things so that I can eat later in, this, in the season. And everybody's got a mask on and everybody stays apart. And that's how we can get slowly back into being able to, um, get back to our society and rev up our economy again. I do think that it'll be really helpful if we can figure out ways to help our restaurant businesses because they're a crucial part of our economy. And um, it's not just that we miss them, but they are a huge part of our supply chain, which we've only 
some of us have only <laughs> realized lately, uh, our whole food supply chain revolves around commercial uh, supply chain. So commercial food supply chain. So that's why we're um, doing this now is to be able to uh, actually participate in life again. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, so and I'll do the same thing. Others have done acknowledge uh, the, all the comments of, of the council members who have spoke. Just so happens they're all women. Uh, the men, none, of the, none of the men have spoken. So nice job, ladies. I, 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 all of you were equally brilliant and I think spot on. And I, one of the things that we know that others don't is uh, both the volume and the nature of the incoming email we get on issues like this. And um, what folks might be interested in knowing is that all those who have opposed, and it, it hasn't been balanced, although we've heard a lot from, from residents who will appreciate uh, us doing what we can to remind people of of comments, I'm going to make in a few minutes about the common good and what our obligations are, right, to protect one another, which really was what, what Council Member Christensen was just, you know, very clearly stating. But the emails, um, I, I, I haven't tried, I've responded to one or two only because I could not sit on my hands and not respond to one or two. I'd like to respond to all of them, but I would have, would have made me nuts and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been coherent and, and I would have gotten more and more angry, I think, as I'd, if I'd responded to them all, because a lot of them were pretty offensive, um, and almost all of them uh, were intended to intimidate with lawsuits, and, you know, and, um, and we're going to come after you individually, and so I want to say to my council members, council member colleagues, I'm proud to be part of a group that refuses to be intimidated by that kind of correspondence, so good on you, good on us, but that's not going to be the basis for us making a decision, but first of all. Second of all, I think the, the fundamental issue here, not just for us, I think across the country, is the balance between our obligation, and we have one, to protect the rights of citizens, their constitutional rights, and as we pass laws, their legal rights, right, as residents of Longmont, as citizens of the state of Colorado. But that gets balanced without an equally compelling obligation to protect to recognize and protect the common good. And that's the tension, it seems to me. The incoming has been, you have an obligation to protect my rights, my constitutional rights as a citizen. And I want to say, I get it. Here's the other thing. I also have an obligation to protect the health and safety of your neighbor and my neighbor. So without, without you know, you, you, all, you all have made this, the points that need to be made in terms of the reasons for this ordinance. I just want to say personally, for and this is ultimately the research, and I'm going to come to that in just a minute. The research, the things we've already heard, and then, and then my own, what I feel to be my obligations as a citizen, are going to translate into a decision for me to support this ordinance. But as a personal, and just as an individual, I feel like uh, I, I'm not going to take great offense to anybody who steps on my constitutional rights. But I also understand or have a view of the common good that compels me to take decisions, to take actions that protect the health and safety of others, in service to others. One of the things that, one of the experiences that have it's come out of this for all of us, I think is a new understanding of what that means. All, the number of times we've heard, and I know it can get to be a mantra, we're in this together. The fact is we are in this together, whether you like it or not. Because the common good is the health and safety where health and safety of all of us. And when it comes to the time when we have a vaccination, a vaccine, a vaccine, a vaccine we can do vaccinations. That will be our real test of whether or not those with means are willing to use them to ensure that every human being on this planet has access real time to a vaccination. Because none of us are safe until everybody as the vaccination. That was the story of polio, right? You, 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 you wanted your kid next door vaccinated, not only your, your kid vaccinated, we, we all had that as we were going up, right? It had to be everybody in the neighborhood or everybody was still exposed. Even if you'd been 
vaccinated, vaccinated. So personally, my decision is going to reflect my belief that I have both obligations, protect rights and to protect the common good. And if I'm going to fail on one side of that right now, it's going to be in the interest of the common good, not in the interest of trampling on anybody's rights, but on the interest of the greatest good for the largest number, in this case, health and safety. So people have talked about the fact that Harold was, was very clear last week um, that he's paying close attention to what's going on across the country, where the issues are, what the reactions have been, what's the phasing of this, how, how strict to be, the, the places where masks should be worn. And it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And we've heard a lot of that. People have assumed a lot about what this would mean, much of which was inaccurate in terms of what I've heard from, from Harold, in terms of how situational the response is going to be in long run in the health, in terms of the health and safety of folks, health, uh, health and safety of folks. So the last thing, you know, we, we kept getting a lot of input on, go look at this epidemiologist, that virologist, this respiratory therapist, whatever. But so I did spend some time today going back to the WHO website, the Surgeon General's website, the CDC website, the Boulder County website, and and I, I'm real clear on what the, what the conclusion is from the help from the majority of health experts around the world. And, and I think Carol was was quoting some of it when he you know. He, but I'm going to read it right. This as today, this wasn't this is kind of current as of this afternoon. The CDC continues to study the spread and effects of the novel coronavirus across the United States. We know from recent studies that a significant portion of individuals with coronavirus lack symptoms, very symptomatic, and even those who have, and this is what Councilmember Peck was saying, even those who eventually develop symptoms can transmit the virus to others before showing any symptoms at all. You know, you're a walking, infectious being without, not, without knowing it. That's why you wear the mask in deference to others. In light of the new evidence, CDC recommends wearing cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, grocery stores, pharmacies, et cetera, especially in areas of significant community-based transmission. That's exactly what we've talked about. That's the Boulder County direction. That's what, what the city manager has, has talked about. So based on what I think is my understanding of the Constitution, based on what I think is my obligation as an elected official, based on what my responsibilities are as a citizen, and based on the science, I'm going to support the ordinance. Uh, may I pretend I'll read it, sorry. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I believe uh, many great points have been made by my fellow colleagues on council. Just a couple that I think don't apply specifically to uh, masking. Um, first of all, I've heard the comments that if we were going to mask, we should have done it earlier. Well, we didn't have the ability to move in an agile and nimble manner. And that's part of the impetus for this ordinance is to have the ability in, you know, in the coming weeks, but also in the future for any unforeseen epidemic or pandemic that comes our way, because one will eventually come along again. Uh, for the city to be able to move in a quick manner, which will, could be more effective than the response that we were able to mount in the initial stages this time. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is that people talk about, at least in some of the correspondence that I, as well as probably all of you have seen on council, about uh, an unelected official wielding this power. Well, Harold doesn't come without accountability. He is accountable to the city council. And while I also believe he does a great job, he does answer to us as a body. And so we are accountable to our constituents, as Harold is technically accountable to us. And I hope people realize that if we were displeased or disagreed with a, a move that Harold is making, there is recourse for it. Outside of that, I will be supporting this ordinance. Susie, do you have anything to say? Um, I will be supporting this ordinance, but I do have a recommendation that we add, um, hold on, let me, I'm holding the space bar down. I'd had some suggested, like just really focusing on, oh, as defined by Boulder County Public Health or just some kind of snip in there that would keep it 
specifically to, to I guess, so it's not so um, interpretive and not so subjective, but just very concrete. All right, Marcia. Um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring has a good point, except that uh, we are in an emergency situation. Um, we are coming into the point of reopening where the risk of uh, a reinfection of a spike uh, kind of scenario uh, comes into play. And we're not talking about some, an ordinance that's going to be in effect for years and years and years. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about getting the ability to act quickly. You know, we could get new news coming out that's saying, yeah, you need to wear gloves if you're going to be shopping because you're leaving behind viruses that last for three days. And so um, Harold would need to be saying, you know, okay, Coles, you need to enforce glove wearing in in uh, in uh, in your reopening protocol, um, and for that reason, I I don't think getting the wording exactly right is is something we should do because the emergency should could come up in two weeks, and we'd like to make sure that um, recommending a change in the PPE protocol would be something that the city manager can do immediately. So I would I would vote for not mucking with it and just get it done. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, this is actually a question for Eugene. Eugene, uh, the way this reads, it says, um, injuries and illnesses may result from contact with biological, chemical, etc. Do you consider the word biological being uh, related to any kind of a pandemic? Or should we put the word pandemic in this? I don't think that uh, this is going to be our first rodeo. I think we're going to be doing this again uh, down the road with other viruses. Um, so should we... It could be passed with uh, an amendment to put the word pandemic in it unless you think that biological covers that. Can I... Have your response? Mayor and Council, I, I do think biological would cover uh, a virus. And uh, this ordinance was drafted to be utilitarian and quick. So um, if Council would like to clarify with an amendment, you know, we're certainly uh, happy to do that. Okay. Um, you know, masks is, is the commonly accepted term, yet Boulder County uses face coverings. So, you know, in, in this ordinance, which I will admit, we cut and paste, put it in, got it in the packet. Um, you know, there's respirators. Respirators are kind of a technical OSHA-like term for things that you put on your face. Uh, but these are illustrative, not an exhaustive list. And so... Uh, we're, we're happy to make amendments if council would like to pass those via motion. Okay. Um, I personally would like the word uh, either face coverings to go along with Boulder County uh, in this wording when you say, but it's not limited to includes, but it's not limited to uh, face mask, gloves, etc. So um, I'm going to move uh, ordinance 0 202023 of section 108-180 with the inclusion of the word um, face coverings. We had a motion, right? Or did we not? Did we? I did. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Yeah, I think there is a motion on the table. Right, so we'll go ahead and take that as an amendment. Thank you, yes. So there's a second to the amendment. All right, it dies for lack of a second. Okay. Oh, no, 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 I was, I couldn't get unmuted. I'm sorry. I don't care. I don't care. I'm, I'm seconded. It. Okay. It's seconded. It's seconded. All right. Let's go ahead and vote. If there's no further, Council Member Martin. Just a clarification. Can this, with an amendment, can this still be a second reading? It seems like sometimes we've gone back to first reading. We're voting. This is the second reading. We're voting on the amendment. Yeah, we're not going back to first reading. Okay. So the current second reading. 
All right, all in favor of the amendment to include face covering? Say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. Passes six to one. Mayor Bagley, say nay. All right, um, I don't see any other hands. I guess what I'd like to do is, I mean, on one hand, I think that everybody's, I think that everybody's reasons were sound, um, but what if the masks were not achieving the end game that everybody is saying? So a lot of the things that we, I mean, a lot of the Mayo Clinic, right, comes out and they basically say that cloth masks, uh, they ask everyone, asking everyone to wear cloth masks can help reduce COVID-19 by people who have the disease but don't realize it. I mean, they agree. But um, I don't just look at this as, uh, I don't just look at this and say, okay, well, what, what, what theoretically would happen? I look at it as what's actually happening. So the Mayo Clinic says all the things Harold, Harold said. Cloth masks are cheap and simple to make. Uh, they can be made from common material. Um, but, uh, but what they also say is there's, there's, they give instructions on how to wear them. First of all, cloth masks should include multiple layers of fabric. Not one, multiple. How many of our masks? I, I, I wear this one. It's a t-shirt, right? Um, next, place your mask over the mouth and nose. Look how many people are wearing masks and not covering their nose. Have your head or use earlobes and make sure it's snug. Most masks aren't snug. Don't touch your mask while you are wearing it. Show me one person wearing a mask that doesn't touch it. If you accidentally touch your mask, wash or sanitize your hands. Move the mask by untying it or lifting off the ear loops without touching the front of the mask to your face. Wash your hands immediately after removing your mask. So I understand what everybody's saying, but if it spreads on droplets, put on a mask and actually cough in your hand or on a mirror. So uh, it's not necessarily protecting. Finally, and this is reading them, finally, here are a few face mask precautions. Don't put masks on anyone who has trouble breathing. Don't use face masks as a substitute for social distancing. So, I mean, I mean, so I, I mean again, Mayor Pennick, on one hand, people say, oh, look at this. We need to wear cloth masks. What I see is a whole society and community of people that don't know how to follow instructions. And they don't social distance, they don't wash their hands. And the question is, is in fact, making people wear masks more danger? Very similar to eight weeks ago when I said, why are we doing this? So next, another thing is, Can't hear you. On the way. There's a lot of confusion among people and misinformation surrounding face masks. Can you discuss that? The masks are important for someone who's infected to prevent them from infecting someone else. Now, when you see people and look at Can't hear it. Right now in the United States, basically, you can't hear it. Fauci says it makes you feel better, but it doesn't do anything. So while we're about, I, I believe, so if you actually go to the 60 Minutes interview that Dr. Fauci did, his quote was, wearing masks might help a little bit, but all you're doing is making, making people think that they're doing something. And so, I'll, I mean, I, so I, I just, I hesitate before we start telling people that they have to wear things or do things. And uh, again, we're, again, we're a government body taking action without any data. So go ahead and tell me that I'm not intelligent. And what was the other word that was used to give compliments to each other? Uh, Dr. Barge, what did you say? I think this was brilliant, brilliant. My unbrilliant and unintelligent comments. All right, uh, uh, Councilman Briado Farron. So Harold, this question is for you. Um, is the county adjusting to situations? So as new research comes up, as things evolve and change, is the county adjusting their ordinances, which in turn affect how we um, pass ordinances? Yes, in terms of their, the order that they're issuing, they, they do evaluate the data. So right now the uh, order is in effect until May 26th. They're in the process of evaluating some data to figure out what does that look like going forward. 
in terms of the situation. And as I indicated, I know there were some comments about CO2 and other issues, and they're actively doing research into that to, to get, understand what that world really looks like. They're actually doing that in conjunction, in conjunction with the other health departments in the metro re region based on that information that they're getting in. Right. So, so the answer is yes. So then if they determine that it's not effective and it's more harmful, what would, what would be the implications for us as a city? Well, if, if Jeff and, and, and they felt that it wasn't there, they would remove the order. Thanks. Or if the data can, or if the data led them to another conclusion. That was what he talked about with me today. And I think the data is going to go until November 4th. Then we'll see. Council member pushes. Sorry. The date of that interview, the 60 Minutes interview, was March 8th. And the CDC has since reversed its, uh, and Dr. Fauci has since reversed what he said. And as I said before, as Councilman Martin said before, what he was being asked was if it prevented us from getting it, not passing it on. So it's taken out of context. And again, that's not what it said. Councilor Martin, you're up. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, stubborn, I think, is is the word you were looking for, Mayor Bagley. Um, but I would just like to remind everybody that we are not deciding what orders to change tonight. We're only deciding if something comes up, let's make sure that we can turn on a dime and change the orders. And in fact, it could mean, you know, that if, if Boulder County is slow to do something that we know on the basis of evidence needs to be done in Longmont, which is different than the base than the rest of Boulder County, we want to be able to do that really fast. Uh, and, and that's all it is. I would probably bet, and I bet Hal wouldn't hold, would hold the stakes, although he wouldn't take the bet, um, that, that he won't ever have to issue any proclamation under this order. But we want it to be in place just in case. And that's what this is. This is just in case. And it's like going out without an umbrella in April. You know, you want that umbrella and you hope you don't have to use it both at the same time. So let's vote. And Council Mark, I'll just, I won't call for a point of order on the stubborn comment. I will just correct you to say brilliant and pragmatic. Okay, Dr. Water. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just you, the, your, the microphone in your system, uh, you, f you fade out sometimes. Just, you just know that with people, uh, if they're not responding, because sometimes you can't, we can't hear you. But if you want to unmute, would you want to take a little back and forth? I have a, a question or two for you. Sure, go ahead. Uh, it sounded to me, so you can correct me if I've misinterpreted, that, that at least part of your case against uh, and amending the ordinance and authorizing Harold to require mask wearing under certain conditions is that people don't comply perfectly, according to the Mayo, the Mayo Clinic website, with their guidance. Because if you don't do all these things the way they're recommending them, you're, you've concluded we ought not to require it at all. Is that, did I hear that? Kind of. Kind of. I guess what I'm saying is that don't tell me to wear a mask. The whole point is cover your mouth when you cough. It's also ignoring the fact that this isn't transmitted just by coughing and sneezing or breathing. It's also transmitted by touching and touching the service and somebody else touches it and touches their mask. I, I, I'm not arguing with that. I, I get all that. Uh, I, here's, the, here's what I'm, I'm trying to reconcile in my, in my mind as I listen to you. And I want to I want to listen to you seriously because um, you've been consistent with your position on this. Um, but I but if we if we apply the standard 
that I think if, if the Mayo Clinic represents a standard for compliance with our ordinance, right? Follow these eight or nine, whatever those steps were to get it right. If we held every ordinance we passed to the same standard, that if there's not perfect compliance on the part of residents, don't pass the ordinance. We would pass no ordinances. We're never going to have perfect compliance. Or no, we're, going to, we're going to have approximations of perfect on everything. Our job is to do, we have, we have a, our job is multifaceted, it seems to me. It, whatever we do with an ordinance, there should be some degree of pedagogy, right, in the ordinance. It, it, there's a teaching opportunity, and the ordinance itself has a chance to do some teaching. This one maybe doesn't do enough, I don't know. But if the ordinance doesn't, then our job, uh, Councilmember Christensen has commented on this several times, she did tonight, part of our job as elected officials is help to help with that, right? In terms of helping people understand what we do and why we're doing it, what does compliance require, what are the degrees of freedom, what are the consequences if you don't, all that kind of stuff. Part of it's the city's job. What the city does with PSAs and all the communication teams outreach to the community is all an attempt to help people understand how to translate what we do into what they do and the reasons why. And it's never going to be perfect. We're human beings, right? We're, we will always be approximations of what we'd like to be. Um, but if, that, if, if, that's, if this, we're going to apply that standard to this ordinance, uh, you know, either we should apply it to all of them or that's an unreasonable standard, even though the guidance from the Mayo Clinic is, is guidance to how to be taken seriously. Go ahead. I was just going to say that yes and no. Uh, I feel uncomfortable forcing healthy people to do things to protect other people or themselves in general. And so, for example, I don't drink. But that would be like saying, well, let's go ahead and take away Mayor Badman's car keys just in case he's drunk, you know. Um, in this particular case, I just think that there are other ways to spread or not to avoid spreading the disease, the event of coughing, sneezing. And you don't need to do it by telling healthy people to wear a mask. Um, and I think that, that, I mean, is that simple? I mean, it's, I understand that it's a state one vote, um, but... Can I push you back just on the, on the, on the, I understand you don't drink. If you did, right? Or if someone you do, who does. I do. Like, like me. <laughs> I, I don't hold myself to the same standard in terms of imbibing as you do. But if you had somebody, if you knew somebody who was drunk and didn't realize it, would you take their keys away from them? Yeah, but. Yes, you would. Now let me finish. Okay. People who think. People who are drunk and don't understand it count on people like you to take their keys away. we got a whole lot of people walking around who think they're healthy and they're infected. What's your obligation then? But you thought, okay, so they're fine. they found in New York that people... Who I answer my question. What's your obligation when people who are infected and don't know it? Well, false analogy. It's like going, you're just going to the bar and just taking everybody's keys. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's vote. I know I'm going to lose. It's six to one. After the vote, I'm not going to care. I run you all. Right? Let's just vote. Get on with it. And then um, we should start the day. So all in favor of the current ordinance, which gives Harold the ability to uh, make us all dress in moon suits and breathing apparatuses and masks and galoshes and whatever Harold wants. I'm just kidding. Just the PPE, et cetera. Um, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay, nay. The ordinance passes six to one. All right. Let's go ahead. We have no items removed. Uh, let's go ahead and have a discussion on the ordinance for crime this amount of bicycles and other vehicles on Main Street. Um, let's go ahead and take a five minute break since it's 920. All right. I love you all. Back soon.
Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City. Just wanted to go forward really quickly and uh, talk to you a little bit about a new ordinance that you actually brought to uh, staff back in December. The idea of bringing an ordinance to, uh, to the City Council or up to the City regarding dismount zones along Main Street. So wanted to go over those kind of quickly with you tonight. Obviously, we're, we're uh, going to try to get this uh, quickly going here. But uh, just wanted to remind you that the idea is that uh, we're going to ask you at the end whether you want to direct staff to leave the voluntary dismount zone, which we have right now on Main Street. If you want, to, if you want us to keep that going in place with no new ordinance, that's an option. You, know, you could direct us to move forward with the ordinance that you have in your packet tonight. We have uh, the draft ordinance in there right now, so um, we can go forward with that. Or you can direct staff to uh, move forward on an ordinance with some changes that we're asking for, actually. So, uh, Susan, if you don't mind, just going to the next slide. So what are the issues? I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty basic. We're talking about bicycle riders on the Main Street sidewalks and that that safety issue right there. We've had a couple of close calls reported to the Longmont Downtown Development Authority, the LDDA. Uh, I've got Kimberly uh, um, McKee, the executive director of LDDA on the line with us for any questions you might have. I should also mention that Ben Ortiz, our transportation planner, did a lot of work on this uh, as well. Uh, but I guess I pulled the short straw on this one to uh, to uh, do the to the, the presentation. So um, anyway, we just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. We're seeing from our, um, when you talk about the community rangers, when they were in a force last year, for about two and a half months, they they observed the activity along Main Street and saw that there was about 82 bikes, bike riders that didn't dismount. Uh, there's other issues out there as well, as far as, uh, you know, the ADA community that's having issues with, whether it's a hearing issue or trying to uh, navigate using a mobility device, such as a wheelchair. Uh, that difficulty with having bicycle riders come up behind you when you can't hear them and they're trying to still call out, but you're trying to use a sidewalk uh, has become an issue as well, as well as just when we're trying to talk about, you, you talked about it earlier in this in this meeting, is the idea that um, we're going to try to expand restaurants eventually into this into this area. This you know, there's already seating areas with Main Street. We're going to try to do more of that. Try to move some people back into the alleys as well. So we're talking about all these different issues. Uh, adding bicyclists to the mix is really going to complicate that and really provide more of a safety issue. So right now we do have that voluntary dismount zone uh, in effect or in in place. It's not very effective, quite frankly, and so. That's one of the reasons for, I think, that you uh, as a council move forward and ask for this ordinance. Next slide, please. So we're talking about other options for bicycling. And so we have had discussions with the bicycling community about this. And what we're getting back from most folks is that people are on board. The bicycling community is on board with this. The, the, the tenants that occupy Main Street uh, businesses and, and other uh, establishments are for this as well. But the issue really becomes, what is your other option? And so we do have the alleyways in the back, the, the half block uh, east and west of, of Main Street that provide that level of uh, rideability. So we're talking about that. Kaufman Street, we're actually going to be you know, investing $7 million in Kaufman Street uh, in the next two to three years as far as trying to build that as a more uh, comfortable level of, uh, of riding as well as doing some other improvements for transit. So uh, Kaufman Street becomes a very viable option. It is right now, quite frankly, it's, it's easily ridden. We don't have Kimbark on the list because we don't feel like that's as safe as, uh, as Kaufman, Terry, and Emory Streets, which are more low traffic. So those are the other <laughs> options that are available to the bicycling community. And so um, we wanted to put those out there. And, and again, the bicycle community is generally behind this, but I'll go over in the next slide Kind of where we have some contention with uh, with some things. So, if Susan, if you could go to the next slide. So, the, the council did request the dismount ordinance in December, and with all the things going on, we are now finally getting back to you, and we appreciate your patience with this. But the questions for council, and really the really the one question that we really want to uh, change or ask you to change in the ordinance and have us move forward on this in in first and second readings in July is expanding that zone 
up to Long's Peak because right now, and as it was stated when you asked for it, it really was just going up to Sixth Avenue, and that's the current that's the current um, um, voluntary standard or voluntary dismount zone. But we were asking that you uh, allow us to move it up to Long's Peak in the ordinance language. Uh, and so that's going to be the first question that we propose for you and, and just ask for your uh, permission on that. Um, also, the idea that we're recommending adding signage to delineate zone, I don't think that's going to be important in the, in the ordinance. And so uh, since we put this together and as we've talked through it with different folks, uh, we're going to put signage. Um, if you want to go forward with this ordinance, we'll, we'll just provide the signage as part of the ordinance. And we'll put those at, at key locations as you enter into this dismount zone so that people understand where it starts and stops. So that's just part of uh, how we would do any kind of thing like this. But if you want to add more to this, uh, that's certainly uh, your prerogative as well. And then we, we talked about recommending including breezeways as far as the dismount zone. And that's where we got the pushback from, from um, the bicycling community that you really utilize those breezeways to be able to cross over and um, uh, be able to bicycle across the zones from the alleyways. So uh, that's the one thing that we'll just kind of give you a heads up that that might come back when we're talking about the ordinance. If you wanted to move forward with including the breezeways in this ordinance, that's something where we're gonna get pushback from the bicycling community and uh, there will be some comments. So at this point, if you wanted to leave that out, that's certainly something that we would, uh, we would uh, do in the ordinance that you bring up. So those are really the things that we wanted to bring forward to you. And, and again, try to quickly put together the conversation here and uh, get your responses back. And if you have any, that would be great to hear at this point. Christensen? Molly, I called on you. Council member Christian. Paul. Yeah. Knocking out a little bit too. Um, okay. Since I was the one who brought this forth, I believe, um, the, the real impetus was all the things that you mentioned, Phil. Uh, it, it's a, a hazard for disabled people, for children, for dogs, for elderly people, for people who can't hear, for people who are trying to maneuver wheelchairs. <laughs> It's, and also as, um, as Phil pointed out, um, we are talking about trying to extend um, restaurants, perhaps a little more onto the sidewalk, which would be very helpful. And we can't do that if we've got people whizzing by on bikes, knocking over people who are going in and out of restaurants. Um, the reason I brought this forth in the first place, though, remember, is because someone died. He was riding on the sidewalk, then he whipped out into traffic, and I'm not saying this is his fault, but I'm just saying this creates a, it's a, creates a situation where more of a hazard, it's, it's just a dangerous situation. Um, I would like to ask Phil why we're talking about extending it up to Long's Peak, which doesn't seem to be a very busy part of downtown. And um, I don't see a need personally to extend it to Long's Peak. And the other thing was, oh, breezeways. I didn't understand, Phil, whether you meant that the bicycling community does want to include being able to use breezeways or does not want to include breezeways. To me, I, um, Breezeways aren't very wide either because they have landscaping. And so then you're talking about the same sort of a situation where it isn't really a, a very good situation for somebody to be war whizzing through the breezeway when somebody's not expecting them to be, uh, you know, somebody going 20 miles an hour <laughs> through the breezeway. Um, so could you clarify for me whether what the bicycling community, uh, what they wanted on that or didn't want? Yes, um, Mayor and Council Member Christensen, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll take your last question first and then I'll pass it on to Kimberly for the question about extending okay. the zone up to, up to Long's Peak. So the breezeways are a bit wider. Uh, there are some entrances that do 
impact the breezeways. So we are concerned about that. What the breezeways are kind of used for right now is really the ability for people to be able to access Main Street and be able to walk their bike, but able to get to Main Street through those breezeways on their bicycle. And they, you know, we, we ask that they slow down, obviously, and that they take it, you know, be, be careful in those areas. But they are a little bit wider than our sidewalks along Main Street, quite frankly. And so what we're doing is we're just, uh, of course, if you want to include the breezeways, that's fine. But just to give you a sense of the comments that we're getting back from the bicycling community, that there'll be some, there'll be some comments on that and some pushback. So we're, we're trying to kind of balance that. But mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that we feel like the breezeways do provide that cross access for bicyclists and at least let them get to Main Street so that they can dismount and then get to their, the front of their business or be able to use the alleyway to get to the back of their business. So those are the things going on there. And then I'll, pull, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kimberly for the well, comment. One more question though about that. Um, the breezeway is not very long. It's the length of a building. They could just as easily and get through there by walking their bike, which they can walk their bike up and down Main Street anyway. I mean, and they can walk through the breezeway. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, keep moving. <laughs> All right, uh, Tessmer Peck, your hand was up. I, I thought Kimberly was going to answer oh, one of sorry. the yeah, if we Go ahead, Ms. McKee. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley, members of council. You know, I do think it is important to extend it up to Long's Peak. We have heard from several property owners up there that they are also experiencing the same issue. You know, there's the Dairy um, Queen there and there's the dance dimension. So it is actually, there's a lot of kids there um, okay. and people continue mm -hmm. to um, go up there. So it does seem like too, also for consistency to keep it throughout the DDA that that would be important. Mm, okay. As to Long's Peak, correct? All right. You done, Paula? Thank you. All right, Councilor Peck? Thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley. My, uh, I, will, I think you should extend it to Long's Peak. I think that's a good idea. Um, the thing with the, brew, the breezeways, I, I can see that as controversial, but the breezeway ends at the sidewalk uh, and then goes onto the street. So people are walking at the end of the breezeway on the sidewalk. So um, there's no way to control that speed through that breezeway when it hits the sidewalk. Uh, has this been a problem or has this been a concern, Kimberly? Uh, have you had complaints about the breezeways? You know, not so much about the breezeways, you know, much more on the sidewalks. Um, you know, breezeways, I think they could be added now or, or maybe added later. If the breezeways continue to evolve as gathering places, um, I think that it'll be harder to have cyclists on it. It's probably a little bit easier right now because there's not as many people hanging out there. Right. However, as we look at, I think all of the real estate that we have downtown, any public spaces, breezeways, alleys, uh, sidewalks are going to be so crucial um, the rest of this year and probably into next year for additional outdoor seating, for being able to make sure people have social distancing, that type of thing. So I really think now is the time to act on, on these bicycle things um, so we don't have continued conflict. So I think the breezeways, um, you know, I think Main Street's the most important, but I also think breezeways could evolve into being just as important um, as we look at alternate solutions. My concern is that we don't have competing visions and competing goals for our city. For example, we're trying to get people out of cars, make a more walkable, bikeable community. So, but if we keep uh, limiting where the bikes can actually ride to get down to the businesses that we want to reopen and be sustainable. So it, it, is, a, it is a kind of a tightrope walk here with those breezeways. Um, I don't wanna limit the access to downtown from people on bikes. Um, I think that's a dangerous way to go, especially when we're looking through Dr. Cog at Vision Zero and uh, other methods of transportation. So for right now, I don't think we should include those breezeways. I think we should wait, monitor, see, 
see how it goes. My only concern with them is that they go too fast when they hit the sidewalk at the end of the breezeways. And um, there could be somebody pushing a baby carriage or the couple I always see in their remote control wheelchairs, which I kind of want one. Um, <laughs> so I think right now, from my perspective, we leave the breeze bay, breezeways out of it, watch, make certain, uh, so we don't take away our ability to have people on bikes get downtown. Be very careful with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peck. Councilmember Martin? And then I will go with Councilmember Waters after Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. So um, what I'd like to understand is what the objection of the cycling community is to dismounting in the breezeway because, uh, you know, as somebody pointed out, it is like 10 steps to get through a breezeway. Why wouldn't you dismount in the alley and, and walk over to Maine? Mayor and Councilmember Martin, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think that the reason it goes back to Councilmember Peck's point that just accessibility through, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of removing something or accessibility for bicyclists <laughs> by by providing this dismount zone, though you can still walk your bike, obviously, on the on the sidewalk. But that was part of the issue was people use those. They feel like they're really good ways to transect the corridor. And uh, they, you know, the people that spoke to us obviously try to do it in a careful way. But that's not to say, um, you know, everybody's going to do it that way. But they try to do it in a careful way, and they want that access and be able to stay on their bike uh, through that, through that uh, as you transect Main Street there. So obviously they're gonna to have to slow down anyway for Main Street. So they're, they have to slow down for that, those crossings as well, those mid block crossings. So that's part of it. But I think it just goes back to that idea that we're eliminating accessibility for bicyclists by, by not allowing them on Main Street and they want to have as much accessibility as they possibly can get. So they're essentially defending a territory I know you don't want to say that, but that's what I want to say. <laughs> um, okay, it's not like, like if they had a if they had a uh, a reasoned argument that was involved, it's going to cause some problem or another. Then I wanted to to be able to hear it. Um, but if it means I have to slow down two hundred feet earlier. I kind of am with Kimberly. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, so, in the in, just on the breezeway catch it, uh, question, I, I I come down. I think where Councilmember Peck is to say, I don't certainly want to restrict that now. I, I, to, let's kind of learn our way forward on it because it's going to be discouraging enough to bicyclists who are trying to. Uh, we're trying to generate more, not less enthusiasm for bicycling. Uh, but I do, is I, is I, I guess it'd be helpful, Kimberly, to hear your vision. And it's hard, I understand, given all the unknowns. closing off streets. We saw Seattle has now permanently closed off 50 miles of streets or whatever. Some Denver's town might be doing the same thing to encourage to create more space for people to be out in distance, but also to encourage bicycling. And um, I mean, as I've thought about this, it's like, how cool would it be if you blocked off traffic from first to, to Long's Peak on a Friday and Saturday night from four o'clock till 10 o'clock? But, but the primary way to get there, it's going to be bicycling, right? So it's like, and if you're not going to tr chain to trees, you're going to have to have a lot of bicycle racks. And uh, where are those going to be placed? And kind of what is that vision? Because it would be helpful if, if I had the gestalt to know what, you know, where does the breezeway fit into the gestalt? And how much of an imposition is it on the bicyclist to have to dismount at the, at the edge of the sidewalk to walk across the street into the, you know, to the next breezeway? Because I get the, I get Phil's point. 
that you know that's the way one way to get east to west in town if you're going downtown and um, and that slows down your commute if you're if you're on a bike help help us with the with, with what you see as the big picture here sure uh, mayor Begley, members of council you know certainly i would love um nothing more than to have more people bike downtown than drive um and so this is certainly no way um, of us hoping that people don't cycle. I think the thing that we realized was no matter what you're doing, everyone becomes a pedestrian at some time, whether you drive or bike or whatever. So making sure that pedestrian friendly happens first is a need for everybody. Um, I would work with you to do everything and anything to close Main Street uh, during these times to have it be out there. It's probably unlikely. So we're looking for other solutions and other real estate. Um, but you know, Phil and I have talked a lot. When we did the voluntary dismount zone, at that point we added 30 bike racks. I think since then we've added 35 more bike racks throughout the DDA. Um, we've talked about on the avenues, taking parking spaces and putting large bike racks there. So we would absolutely evolve any bike facilities as this continues to happen. One of the things that I'm always talking to Phil about, and I think when we were talking about the steam corridor, one of my visions for transportation is that there would be bike routes that all intersected through downtown. So every uh, neighborhood led to downtown and that became the intersection to connect all the neighborhoods together. And I think having a very robust network of both pedestrian and cycling amenities is very important. You know, this summer as we're social distancing and things like that, and again, I don't want to say that we're being very cautious of how we're going to have people come together, but in the past we've talked about how could we do bike in movies, how could we do different things like that to really encourage the cycling community. So I think our vision is how do we keep everyone safe? I mean, keeping people safe is all I talk about these days, whether it's if they're going into businesses, how are they getting here or those type of things. So I would love to see cycling take a front seat, especially this summer, especially as we're trying to encourage people if they aren't comfortable going in places, at least go out and get exercise. So cycling into downtown and walking around and looking at the public art or window shopping or, or picking up food and taking it home is really important. Uh, so we will continue to work on that as alternate transportation and certainly look at all of that infrastructure and add to it as needed. Um, breezeways are 125 feet. Uh, I cycle to work almost every day in the summer. I will say I have walked my bike through breezeways and when no one else is in there, I have cycled through breezeways, right? So I think that uh, people will, will, will do it either way. But as we encourage maybe cafe dining or more seating or whatever, it could become a problem, but we could grow into that um, and amend it and add those as needed. They still could be voluntary. Hopefully, as people get used to dismounting, um, they will um, just walk it anyway if they see a crowd in there. So we hope like that education would, would take forth. But you know, a lot of the times the cyclists that we see are just booking it and they're not they're not coming to downtown, they're coming through downtown. And Every street has bike lanes. Terry has bike lanes. There's so many easier and quicker ways than dodging pedestrians to do that. Well, I, I favor the dismount zone, and uh, and my my I think I'm leaning towards going slow on the on the restrictions on the breezeways until we you know we figure out what the outdoor dining is going to be like, and 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 obviously Phil and his crew will do a whole lot of work with with our bicycling community to understand you know what to what's at stake if we can't get it right, so. Um. All right, who else? Let's I guess I'll go. <laughs> I didn't quite catch that. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, so, I, I agree with what uh, Kimberly was talking about, that I think a lot of the, the problematic uh, bicyclists and, and skateboarders and longboarders and things are simply commuting through downtown. I see that more than folks that are riding to downtown as a destination. Um, I just wanted to mention some of the things I saw in the 2012 survey that was provided in our packet that I really enjoyed. Uh, reading as far as alternatives to 
or ways in which this would be effectively enforced. And that would be possibly using the restorative justice technique as well as uh, uh, taking a while to use signage as well as you know a, a period of time for education before the the mandatory dismount zone is fully fully realized in some sort of punitive way. Uh, those two things really stood out to me. And while you know it was interesting reading that survey saying that they expected a lot more traffic when the Roosevelt Apartments opened, showing some of the dated uh, information in it. Uh, I thought that that was telling, if you will. Um, I do hope that you know. There's a time when I live close to downtown and rode a bicycle down there more often than not. And uh, I would actually use the alleyways much more than I would use the, um, the sidewalks. And I think that going to that issue as well, um, I could see how that'd be dangerous if not trying to obey the, same, the similar rules of one way that the cars have to obey in the alleyways as well. Those are just a few of my um, observations from reading through the packet on these issues. As far as specifically the, the breezeway, I'd be inclined not necessarily to include that in the mandatory dismount zone at this time. All right, I guess what I'd ask you is rather, okay, so does somebody have a motion they'd like to make instead of just, we can say our opinions, but somebody make a motion. Aaron, do you wanna make a motion? Councilor Christensen, you wanna make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion that we pass I don't have the number before. But well, we, just move, we, move, we move the ordinance to, set to first reading. Uh, Paul, you're on mute. You're, on mute. you're muted. Uh, there's a motion on the table from Council Member Christensen to move this ordinance to first reading. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, it's been seconded by Council Member Peck. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries uh, unanimously. Thank you very much. Like, is Kim Kimberly, um, if there's anything you'd like to change in the ordinance between now and then, I I'd like that feedback between now and first ordinance, if that's okay. All right, cool, thanks. All right, Council Member Christensen. Uh, just to clarify, um, what we passed was to also extend it up to Long's Peak and leave out the breezeways? Yeah. Yeah, it's coming back the same ordinance that's in our packets. Yes, up to Long's Peak, no breezeways. And then so if we want to change that, someone will have to make a motion. Uh, well, I also think that, you know, some of the breezeways, as Kimberly has said, if some of them are used for people to extend their businesses out, Bicyclists are smart people. They're not going to plow into something that has a bunch of people sitting there or a bunch of uh, dress racks out there. So each breezeway will will generate, depending upon how it's used, um, its own sort of uh, behavior, hopefully. I mean, I'd much rather people just dismount voluntarily, but they have not done that. So that's why, once again, we have to pass an ordinance. Thank you. We'll be back to in July with those ordinances. Great. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right, let's move on to mayor and council comments. Does anyone have anything else to say or can we go home? All right. All right, we all want to say stuff. Council member Yago Faring, then Dr. Waters, then council member Martin, then council member Christensen. Okay, so the first thing is typically when school is in session, we hear from the Longmont Public Library about their summer reading program, but because they don't have a way to get disseminate that information, I kind of wanted to, I want to um, make public, you know, make this public that um, the summer reading program will be continuing um, this year from June 1st through July 31st. I think they typically have done in the past um, tickets to Lakeside, but we don't know if they're, I, we, it's not gonna be open. So um, 
They did through the Friends of Longmont Library receive um, donation to provide books to winners or people who turn in their, the kiddos who turn in their um, summer reading bingo. So I wanted to get that out there um, to be active. The um, drop off, if you have books that you still need to turn in, you can drop those off as well. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I found out from CDE that um, we, uh, the district will receive, um, we have earmarked marked $50 million um, for COVID relief funds. So that's exciting news. That's, um, that's great news. I, I guess this would be a reason to push filling out your census so we can have numbers. We were given that amount based on the numbers that we have um, a different, a, you know, de defined in our, in our district fill out that census so we're eligible for more funding. So that's all I have to say, good night. All right, Council Member Waters. Uh, two things, Mayor Beckley. I wanna just go back to, <clears throat> in Harold's report, uh, he shared uh, the result of the, of the work of a group Ann Maka had, had organized through the museum. Uh, and Ann is our education curator. I've had a chance to have my path cross hers. I wanna say, uh, nice going, Ann. And to those who organized around and with Ann, um, that's that's a great example of the staff rising to the occasion. So uh, high five. Uh, the other observation would be that um, at some point, I, I, since we we postponed interviews from Saturday, uh, we ought to get on the calendar uh, when we're going to interview candidates for boarding commission uh, positions or appointments and. Um, Prior to that time, I, I think we we ought to have a, a session like this to talk about what we want to learn, what's the protocol going to be, uh, how will we learn in virtual five-minute interviews, what we need to learn, what have we heard from staff about what their needs are in terms of boards and commissions, so that we can have an efficient process that honors our time, the time of the applicants, and, and, the, and what we're asking of them as volunteers uh, on behalf of the city of Longmont. So, I, I'll, I'll, get my, I'll get my calendar out if we're ready to pick a day. So that, that's already been put on the an upcoming agenda, so we'll have an opportunity to do just that. Councilor Martin, was your hand up? You were, one, you were next. Yeah, I was next. Um, I'm going to be something of a curmudgeon. Um, we've been talking a lot about the common good. And that is really important to me. It's more important to me than my constitutional right not to wear a mask or a funny hat. Um, but um, I think that uh, the common good is tied together with things that are constitutional rights like respect for one another's property. Um, the city has the property. We don't have homesteading here. Um, we respect each other's property rights. We don't deface each other's property rights. Um, yet we seem to have uh, rewarded a, a, a group of, of uh, children, families um, for defacing uh, a sensitive riparian preserve. And I don't like that. I mean, it's great that we are, we've come to a, a kind of a solution where, well, we're gonna let the kids use it during the summer because they don't have any place to ride, ride. but then in the fall, um, we're going to restore it to what it's supposed to be, and this time we're not gonna reclaim it. Um, you know, everybody says, well, they've been doing that for years, like that is uh, some reason why it's okay. You know, you've been um, camping on my front porch for years and I never noticed, but then this morning I noticed and it scared me and I called the police and it's not a defense that, well, she didn't call the police last night or the night before, so I must have a right to sweep on this porch. No, you don't. And 
this community at, at a large number of members of this community have fought hard to protect our riparian areas. And I think that it's a duty of parents um, to let their children know that we don't have homesteading here, that we do have property rights, that the city has property rights, and that destroying a nature, serve, uh, a nature preserve is vandalism. So I just want to get that side of the story out there. And sorry, folks, but that's the way I feel about it. Uh, Councilor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I think this. Uh, I think this issue deserves a larger conversation. Um, you know, maybe twenty years ago or thirty years ago, that was okay. But things have changed, and I'm not going to demonize children for being creative. I did like the idea that the last caller made, where um, the community gets together in conjunction with the uh, city. I think that would be very creative. It would be enabling the residents to have a buy-in. What, what other way would be good to have children get involved with their city other than you know, to plan their own play area and what they need and the parents help build it? I, th I think this deserves a bigger discussion and I will, uh, if nobody else does next week, I'm going to move that we put it on an agenda to discuss because it's interesting and I will never demonize children for being creative, even if it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Life is- Point of order? Yeah. yeah Councilor Martin? I don't like being accused of demonizing children. I uh, yeah. am not talking about the children at all. I'm talking about their parents. Uh, look, I'm, I'm an overrule point of order, because I don't think Council Member Peck was saying that. Mm-mm. I, 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 don't, I think I think I think I, I didn't hear that. I can understand why you take offense if she was, but I don't think she was. But the uh, what else, Councilmember Beck? Um, I just agree that we should discuss this perhaps at a, a, a bigger discussion at a different meeting, and I'll make a motion next week if nobody else does to put it on an agenda to discuss. Okay, and then Count, have you said anything yet, Councilmember Christian? Go ahead. Yep, your turn, Paula. Paul, your turn. Oh. I want to thank Susie for the census. That's, we got to get people to fill out the census. It's, uh, it's only 65% or something. That is not good enough. You know, it's, it is your obligation to fill out the census. And we much prefer to have people do this remotely um, on their computer or by mail, both of which are very easy to do, uh, as opposed to forcing somebody to come to your house and knock on the door and try to get you to answer questions that you could, it, it really takes five minutes. So just do it. Um, I appreciate what Councilman uh, Martin said and also Councilman Peck. I do think that this, I would, um, according to some of the information we've gotten about the bike jumps, um, this whole thing is going to be demolished this Friday. So I would like us to put that off a little bit so that we could have a discussion. I think there's a huge amount of community uh, interest in this. We got a petition with 2,000 names on it. So I, I do think that before we demolish something, we have a responsibility to have a discussion about it and let people know um, the difference between kids having fun, which we were all kids and we all loved our bikes and we all, you know, we, want, we all want our kids to have fun. But there's a difference between private property and uh, the city's property, which we have liability for, and we're also trying to develop as a right prior in F, um, area, and we're also trying to restore the flood, the uh, do the damage done by the flood. Um, we have to be able to do those things, and um, but I want kids to be able to have a voice in um, 
what goes on and they're doing you know creative stuff this happened in uh council i mean mayor bagley's neighborhood and the city worked with them to a happy situation we have a bicycle area down at uh, uh dickens park and that's not very far from where these kids are anyway and um uh so I would like to, to see if we can make a compromise and give the kids agency in what they're doing. But also, this is a big liability issue too. So that has to be discussed and um, we have to see if that's possible. Anyway, so that's what I would like. And also I would just want to say to everybody who's out there, it's tough. I know it's getting very tough. But just be patient, be strong, be patient, be courageous, and know that we're all we're doing the right thing by taking care of each other. So this will not last forever. Right, and we are we are holding off on the the, the demolition. So it's yeah. had an opportunity to, to have that discussion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, Count, uh, Harold, you have anything? No, I just wanted to clarify that we're, um, as stated earlier, we're, we're going to deal with this in the fall. And so in the meantime, we're going to work with them. So the activity on Friday is, is not going to occur. So that was a conversation that David had. Eugene, anything? No comments, Mayor. All right, we have a motion, Councilmember Peck, to adjourn. Hello, adjourn. I'm really glad I have a job on this council. Makes me feel so important. It is important. Very important. Get your it's been, all right. Moved by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Peck. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. Passes unanimously. We're adjourned. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.